Hello, uh, good morning to everyone. Yes. Okay, so uh, we are very, very happy to welcome you to the fifth uh, Barcelona Summer School on Bilingualism and Multilingualism. This is, as I say, the fifth edition of the school. And uh, is, since it started, it has been a well attended very internationally uh, attended also event. We have amongst you about 20 um, different countries of origin, or at least countries where you state that you're working. And this is an immense pleasure for us, because it means that the program that we have uh, put together is of interest uh, to a general audience, which is what we are um, aiming most. Albert Costa, to my left, is going to go through the program. But uh, let me tell you that, uh, in our view, this is, in fact, what has attracted such a wide international audience, the high quality of our speakers year after year. Of course, the high quality of you attendees do. And uh, the proof of it is the fact that we're going to be able to hold a day and a half uh, in our program of presentations from you, which is the other um, sort of emblematic um, uh, element in the program. I think we were the first school to devise such a kind of organization, having very high uh, quality speakers, international speakers, but also having very high quality presentations from uh, researchers, we could say perhaps young researchers in many cases, or uh, researchers starting their professional careers, uh, in a sense. Some of you have uh, been here before, and uh, this is again uh, something that makes us very happy. So uh, there are repeaters here. And uh, there are more people who would have liked to attend, which is something else that you can see. But we actually have a full house. And there's even people who would have liked to attend, and uh, there's no more chairs, and for security reasons, we cannot add any more chairs. Um, so if anyone wants to invite anybody, uh, you should leave the chair for this person, because really, no one else can sit here, as I say, for security purposes. So in fact, uh, welcome then um, to the summer school. It's also, uh, it's not only academic work that we do here, we have a, a social a social networking uh, part in the school, and you will see it throughout these days. And, uh, and, um, and we have suggestions for that. And huh? we will be telling you throughout the days. Now, the university that uh, welcomes you is called Pompeu Fabra. And uh, we, we, we like to, to call it uh, Universitat, which is the Catalan word. Because as you know very well, and you've seen yesterday, perhaps, this is a, a, a country where the two languages are very lively, and there's, um, there's a lot uh, politically behind, uh, behind them. Uh, always very peacefully, as you also saw yesterday, but uh, there's issues here. And uh, we definitely have two languages, and Pompeu Fabra was the person who managed to work with our language to standardize it. So before Pompeu Fabra, of course, Catalan is a language that has been spoken for centuries. Okay, it, it comes from Provençal. Uh, some people in the south of France also. There's a region in south of France which we actually call the north of Catalonia, Catalonia Nord. But Pompeu Fabra came along, and although being an industrial engineer, he wasn't a linguist because the family didn't allow him to just study languages at the time. Yeah, he had to study industrial engineering, which is not easy. So he did a lot of work uh, uh, in that sense. But then uh, that's what he wanted. He wanted to work with languages. And he uh, then standardized the language, meaning he um, put uh, forward, he worked on a grammar of Catalan, written in Catalan, he also produced a grammar of Catalan written in French and a grammar of Catalan written in English. So he also wanted Catalan to be an international language. He wanted Catalan to be known elsewhere. Okay? And he also produced the first dictionary of uh, Catalan. So 
he worked on grammar and semantics and, and lexis. The only thing he perhaps did less of work, but still did something is on phonetics. Okay? Uh, you have a very interesting uh, exhibition of his works at the library, which is one part of the university that we deeply recommend you to visit, and perhaps we can organize that at some point. Just, uh, I mean, it's across the road, but with an interesting underground tunnel that takes, with, uh, takes us there. And it's built, and this is another curiosity about uh, university premises, uh, it's built inside a um, kind of tower, which on the top holds a water pond that waters the uh, green park adjacent to us, which is called Ciutadella Park, where the zoo is actually located. So perhaps you've seen that on the map. Now, the Pompeu Fabra, the Universidad Pompeu Fabra started as a city university, meaning it wanted to use all premises that were already present uh, in, in the city of Barcelona, renovated them, and wanted to have an impact on the surrounding area of the university. So we got four or five, um, four or five, I say, I don't know, but four or five uh, buildings uh, spread over this part of the city. In fact, I don't know whether you've seen that on the web. Now, the building where we are was uh, military barracks. Barracks. They were renovated. And the town hall allowed Pompeo Fabra to use this building, actually buying it, of course, previously, with the compromise that this tower that was watering the park would be kept the same functioning as uh, what it is, yeah? It waters uh, the park because it actually uh, sucks up water which is underground. That's why it is very important. It's quite extraordinary. You walk into the library, going back to the library, you look up and you see mirrors, and those mirrors hold on top of them the water. The mirrors themselves, they allow you to see the streets around. So it is quite an architectural um, Jewel. Okay. Having said this, I think that I can stop. Um, again, uh, thank you very much for trusting on the school, and I hope that uh, everything pleases you. Don't hesitate to tell you anything that you consider that you want to comment uh, throughout these days, and uh, to the rest of the team, which uh, Albert will introduce. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carmen. Louder. Okay, I just, I just said that, it's okay? I said, usually you would start in a summer school, I guess, uh, with child acquisition, then you go to adult language processing, and then you end up with a language attrition or the aging population, okay? But we have inverted this today, so we start with uh, aging, okay? So my talk is essentially about um, uh, the interplay between uh, bilingualism and healthy aging. Okay, I will start, uh, I'd like to start with this slide to show li li linguistic diversity all over the world. And as you see, do you see the mouse there? Yes. Even Spain has a, its linguistic diversity and we are actually in, this, in the region in Spain where really bilingualism uh, is uh, represented at its uh, best. But there are some areas in the world, like look, those, those circles, where you have really the coexistence of, of many languages. Look, for instance, India. I'm spending recently some time in India, in Nepal, to, to study this phenomenon. Look, 3,300 mother languages, okay? 21 plus one official language. The plus one is, is probably English, and there are 22 other languages really spoken. So almost everyone in India is bilingual or, multi, or multilingual. Okay. So we will end up with this uh, phenomena that probably it's difficult to find in the future monolinguals. Okay. Nepal is the same, but on a, small, on a smaller scale, it has less than 7 million inhabitants. Okay. But it has, if, I, uh, if I'm correct, something like 150 official languages. There's, n there's not by, by law, there's no one official language. Also, most people learn in school Nepali, but uh, all languages have the status as an as a official language. And I just want to say that even in a small country like Nepal, there's an increase of dementia rate, okay? Which is one of the main topics uh, of my talk uh, today, of my, of, my, of my lessons, actually. 
And it's funny to see that uh, the Nepalese dementia society brings it back to growing urbanization, unhygienic food, and uh, hectic lifestyle have been really uh, involved into the genesis of this uh, increased rate of uh, dementia. But we will see much more about this uh, in, during uh, my lesson. <clears throat> Just an overview, dementia, or cognitive decline in general, is really a, a, a social, social economic problem in, uh, in our century, actually, okay? We expected, for instance, in, in China to have more than 50 million uh, Alzheimer dementia patients by 2050, okay? These are huge numbers. If you uh, translate it into, into really money, it means that uh, governments have to spend billions for taking care of uh, dementia, uh, individuals with uh, dementia. So, <clears throat> and you should also know that there is no, there's no drug, no medicine uh, uh, on the market that can actually cure dementia. There are some drugs which um, scientists say they may delay up to six months uh, the onset of dementia or really um, slow a little bit the progression, but really we don't have nothing actually uh, up to date. <clears throat> before starting, I mean, you probably know this all better than me, before starting uh, uh, was my lesson, I just want to remind you, whenever we study um, bilingual subjects, there are some important things we should always take into account. That is, um, some of these issues are related to our participants, our bilingual subjects, like their language history, the function of the languages. We always have to measure the level of proficiency and exposure, and the best would be with really uh, psycholinguistic material. I usually don't like self-reported uh, uh, questionnaires. Who of you uses self-reported questionnaires? Bad. <laughs> you won't publish with us. <laughs> And of course, we have to know uh, stimulus choice and task. Just an example, if you have, uh, for instance, um, immigrants, okay, maybe they, have, they never learned to read and write in the native language, so we cannot use a reading task, and so on. We need to have some more uh, information about their background, about the social economical status, because those are all factors that may influence, specifically in this case, brain activity or brain differences. Cultural differences are equally important and I will show you later some, <coughs> some new information about individual brain differences. But even neuroanatomy <coughs> can make a small difference in cognitive performance. And the best thing would be, especially for aging population, if you have also an idea about their cognitive uh, status. And of course, whatever I do, whatever experiment I run, I must, I should have at least one experimental hypothesis. Okay. Most of the work I will present has to do with neuroimaging, which is, of course, very uh, uh, expensive. It's costly, time-consuming. Time I cannot just spend 10, 20,000 euros running an experiment to see, let's see if this linguistic uh, theory works in the brain. Okay? So if, you have, if you have another effect, you lost a lot of money. Right? <coughs> and it would probably end up like this. I just showed this as a, um, <coughs> some historical uh, an anecdote. 20 years ago, we would uh, have thought, at least in the brain, that each language would have its uh, representation in the brain, okay? Like, <clears throat> you see a lot of uh, languages here, but this is not the case, actually. We know from 25 years of uh, neuroimaging that uh, languages are all stored in the same language area, okay? So it's not right to say one language is maybe more anterior, posterior, or in the other hemisphere, or not, okay? But of course, we see differences in activity between two different languages, okay? But just please keep in mind that those differences are mostly outside classical language areas, okay? We may see, for instance, if I compare Chinese, English bilingual, I compare Chinese to English, okay? I see much more right hemispheric activity for Chinese, okay? But this is because of the very essence of Chinese. It's a more visuospatial and semantically loaded language than not English. So, and if you know brain anatomy, you, saw that visual, uh, you must know that visuospatial functions are mostly in the right hemisphere. So that explains why Chinese activates more right hemisphere as compared to English, okay? Then we have also cases like 
bilinguals who speak fluently uh, one language and the other one is not spoken so fluently. Okay? And for a language which is uh, not spoken so fluently, I usually observe some extra brain activity in certain areas. Again, outside classical language areas, I would see brain activity in areas which we call language control areas. Okay? Those are areas connected to attention, executive functions, working memory, okay? because it's more difficult to speak a language which I don't master perfectly. It's less automatic in my brain. So I need more neural resources for mastering it. Okay? So these are the differences we see in the, in the brain. But it does not allow us to say that two languages are differently stored or represented in the brain. Okay? Uh, it's not a question of anatomy. It's a question of more physiology. Okay? <coughs> and those are actually those three crucial variables we see, we have seen in the last 20 years that make the difference, okay? Like age of acquisition, second language acquisition, even if you're a very, very, very high proficient bilingual speaker, but <coughs> especially for grammatical tasks, we see that there's some extra activity for your second language if it was learned after the age of puberty, okay? Proficiency. The less proficient I am in one of my languages, the more brain activity it entails, okay? again, outside language areas. And the same for exposure. And it's a pity that many of us don't study, actually, exposure of language, of, of our subjects, okay? because it makes a huge difference. If I, if I have, one of my first studies was actually with uh, Spanish-Catalan subjects from Barcelona. We shipped them all in, in Milan, and like 25 years ago, and even Professor Costa was one of those subjects. He was uh, <laughs> finishing his studies then, but then, yes. I was a student too by the, by, at that time. Uh, and they were all high proficient speakers of Catalan and Spanish, all really uh, early acquires of both languages. But the only difference was that uh, as a native Catalan speaker, you are less exposed to uh, Spanish in Barcelona than as a native Spanish speaker, because you're much more exposed to your second language, which is, which is Catalan. And that really makes a huge difference in brain activity. Okay? Just this difference in exposure makes a huge difference in brain activity. <coughs> so today, uh, we're going to talk um, about, of course, the cognitive implications of bilingualism. I just talked about uh, you, Albert, uh, coming to uh, Milan 25 years ago for doing one of my first experiments, and uh, yeah. Um, we're talking about, uh, briefly about bilingual versus monolingual language processing. Mostly uh, it will focus uh, around language control. We mentioned a little bit about the uh, cognitive advantages. I saw <coughs> in the booklet there are many posters uh, or presentations about executive <coughs> functions, so you surely may be also interested in my opinion about, uh, about this. And then we switch over uh, to the neural implications and much of the time will be spent on healthy aging. <clears throat> we will talk about um, brain plasticity, about neural reserve and neural compensation. You have questions still here? Everything is fine? So what does SES stand for? What? What does SES stand for? Social economical status. Good question. Whenever you see some abbreviation, just, just really uh, ask. <coughs> I welcome you, <coughs> my cat, Sissy. But then she was six months old, now she's 14. She's well, still wet. So this slide is just to show you how subconsciously we would name this picture, cat, okay? It happens in all of our brains when we have to name pictures. <coughs> we have to do uh, internal competition between items that are phonologically similar, like hat and cat, and items that are semantically close to it, like dog, okay, and, and other animals, okay. This happens whenever we have to name and whenever we, we speak, okay. But in uh, bilingual, it's a little bit more complicated, okay, because competition is not only between items of the same language, but also between items of the other language. And not only with the translation equivalent of cat, but also with uh, uh, semantically and phonologically similar uh, items in the other language, which is not requested, okay? Like again, dog, and here the competition would be probably with mau and gau. Do you know what language that is? 
What? Cantonese. Cantonese. Who is Cantonese? There's some Cantonese speaker? No, I'm not Cantonese. So what language do you speak? Russian. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's <laughs> linguistically very close to Cantonese. <laughs> I just know Chinese and... Uh, All right. Okay. So who is from China? How do you say dog and cat in Chinese? Go. Go. So it's very similar, right? Okay. Mau, gao, in in Cantonese, okay. Okay. So whenever we have to do a naming task, but this is also true for um, a spontaneous speech, okay. A bilingual has to. Um, do this competition with the other language, okay? And this is one of the real differences between monolingual and bilingual language processing, okay? And there may, there may be sometimes a conflict, okay? Imagine you are, <coughs> you are, yes? No, I don't mean that, but it's yeah. excellent to clarify this uh, from, from the start. You know, in, in neurolinguistic, the, um, the best definition is a bilingual is someone who uh, speaks, understands uh, two languages, and uh, you can then you can really then uh, classify a bilingual based upon age of acquisition, proficiency, and even exposure. Okay, it may it may hold on even for a late by a bilingual who learned his second language after age 20, even. Okay, you have all, also these processes in in the brain. Okay, and Sometimes it, it's not easy to find the words you're looking for in the other language, okay? So this is just a very, very uh, basic exam example of what a language conflict is. And maybe the other language, the unwanted language, just slips through, okay? And you have in some, some way to inhibit that language. And not all uh, cognitive psychologists and psycholinguists are, uh, are in accordance, for instance, with us about inhibition, okay? There are some models that just spotted act activation. But as a neuroscientist, I must tell you, 33% of our neurons are inhibitory interneurons, okay? And without them, we would all have epileptic seizures, okay? So really, half of the activity of our brain is just to inhibit, okay? So, and I think uh, we should take some messages from neuroscience into cognitive science, okay? So I'm really one of those fellows who really uh, uh, favor inhibitory control models, okay? Because that's how the brain works. <clears throat> How can we investigate, like in the lab, um, language control? One of the most commonly uh, used paradigms is a language switching paradigm, okay? Uh, it's just exemplified here by um, naming a picture uh, and choosing the language based upon its color of presentation, like red would be the first language and blue would be uh, to use the second language. And we have, in such a paradigm, some trials which are labeled as switch trials, okay, when the language changes, okay, when the color of one picture is different from the color of the previous picture. Uh, someone increased my voice. I'm not in puberty now. <laughs> ah, it's a guy there, good. And, uh, of course, a trial um, with the same color is called a repetition trial. And if I now subtract from switch trial and repetition trials, I have actually a good index of language control. And this is used widely in behavioral science and in, in, in our field in neuroscience, okay? And this is how the brain areas uh, that actually work to avoid language conflicts, okay? We just have to learn them all, all together. And I will explain you, we will see them during my, my lesson, uh, what they are for. One of the most important of them is the anterior cingulate cortex, ACC, okay? It's uh, our monitoring area. Okay, and we will see that it's not specific for language, okay? It's, it monitors all of our actions, okay? Not only a language. It isn't an error that corrects an error. It just signals to other areas, oh wait, that's wrong, or wrong language choice, okay? And it communicates with left caudate, okay? It's a subcortical uh, uh, structure, just sort of, of small supervisor which really puts uh, signals information to other areas, like the prefrontal cortex, which is an area that really uh, can inhibit or select responses, okay? And we have two other areas. SMG means supramarginal gyrus, but just keep in mind it's uh, the inferior parietal lobule bilaterally that are much more involved into those attentional mechanisms of language control to 
bias or put uh, attention towards a language, okay? And from a, from a language. So we have the anterior cingulate cortex, prefrontal cortex, the caudate, and parietal, uh, inferior parietal lobule. <coughs> you just see it on a different brain slice, prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, left caudate, and inferior parietal lobule, okay? And since the lesson should be interactive, now I ask you, what area is this? Question, ACC, wow, we are so fast. And this one? Perfect, and what's this? And this one? Yes, and this one? It's just a joke, okay? Because you, you were so, so fast, so I have to make it uh, more, more difficult, okay? Recently, we have, we have updated our, our model. That paper was from 2008. In 2016, last year, we updated it because a lot of new, new information has come recently in. Okay? And the whole network is much more complicated. As you can see, uh, the prefrontal cortex, now we, we really uh, uh, we divide them between left and right side. The left side would be much more uh, involved in uh, response selection and uh, activation. Why? On the other hand, the right prefrontal cortex is much more involved in, inhibi in inhibition, okay? When I have to, to inhibit a language, it's mostly done through the right prefrontal cortex. Another area which was added into the model is the cerebellum, okay? We will see later when I talk about the adaptive control uh, model that it's, it's involved in opportunistic planning during language switching. <coughs> it's always good to know uh, uh, the first experiments in the field, so I just show you briefly uh, uh, the first experiment done with these techniques, with neuroimaging on uh, language control. The very first was done in, in London in 99 by Cathy Price, David Green, and uh, von Stuttnitz. Their subjects had to translate words, okay? Even uh, translation is a very, very potent um, paradigm to study language control because I have to go from one language to the other, okay? And translating words activated selectively the codates, okay, especially the left co codate. This study is from Leitonen and colleagues done in, in Finland uh, with Finnish uh, uh, Swedish bilinguals or Finnish Norwegian, I don't remember well, but it was sentence trans translation. And a part of the left codate, we have also some activity in the left uh, prefrontal cortex. Okay? And this is this is very nice study, still done by, by uh, Korean and colleagues and Katy Price in London and in Tokyo. Uh, with three different groups of bilinguals and with two different techniques. One was a, a um, MR, MRI experiment and the other one was a PET experiment. I will show you later what a PET is. And uh, it was a semantic priming experiment. Semantic priming means you see, uh, for instance, a prime and then the target word, okay? And if the prime and the target word were in two different languages, it selectively activated the left codate, okay? So it is really a crucial uh, area involved in language control. By now, many other studies have, uh, have, been, have been published. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did a meta-analysis on our published study on uh, switching. And the network you see here is very, very similar to the model that we actually postulated uh, years, uh, years before. You have prefrontal uh, activity, <coughs> you have the parietal activity, you have both codates and the ACC. This is a study we've done a couple of years ago in, in Geneva to uh, study really much better language control in the same group of, of subjects. Our subjects were 12 students from uh, the translation school in Geneva. Uh, the native language was German, and they were all uh, becoming better in French, so one day they, would, they could become uh, simultaneous translators, okay, professional. And in the experiment, we just it was a picture naming experiment, and uh, just ask them to, to name the picture based on the cue that will follow the picture. And in one part of the experiment, which we called uh, the monolingual part, although all subjects are bilinguals, uh, the cue could be name or verb. So if you see uh, the cue name after a picture, like in this, in this, uh, in this case, a picture of car, the subject has to, uh, to use only in uh, in their first language, auto, fahrzeug, whatever it is, whatever noun, it's related to this picture. If they would see the uh, cue verb, they have to generate a verb related 
to the picture, which may be to drive, to park, okay, to steer, and so on. Okay? And everything was done in their native language, in German. Okay? The second part of the experiment uh, was exactly the same, same stimuli, same subjects, okay? but the cue changed. The cue was not anymore noun or verb, but the cue was uh, German or French. Okay? But we were not interested in French, actually. We were just interested in what would happen in German here. Okay? So we analyzed only brain activity related to German nouns in this part of the experiment, and we compared them to German nouns of this part of the experiment. Okay? So the images I show you is just generating words or nouns in German. But we are in two different contexts. Okay? The subject knows that in one context, it's, it's a monolingual context, okay? because the selection is only between noun and verb in the same language. And the subjects, of course, know that the other context is a bilingual context. Okay? And this is what happens in the, in the brain. And who of you is going to explain me this? Just imagine I cannot explain this. So I need your input. You look, you look very interested, so. Yes. <laughs> well, of course, we can take, uh, I mean, areas like in the first, second, uh, third, like area of artists in Mali, of course, but it's a different application. Like, it's stronger in the, it seems that there is something stronger in the second. Yes. the same subjects, but they behave totally differently. Okay? So it means that even the amount of time probably we spend in a bilingual context uh, or in a monolingual context may, may eventually make a difference in our brain. We'll talk about, about this later, but this is really, really important. I mean, all of you probably uh, are in a bilingual context, okay? except those for whom English is the only language. Okay? Sometimes if you... Uh, let me see. Uh, you both are Russians? OK, so if you speak now together Russian with, uh, with your neighbor, uh, do you think your brain would be like this or like this? Like this? Because you know that we speak English also here, OK? Yes. But if you would go now ho home or have dinner together and speak only Russian and there's no other language uh, uh, popping out, then your brain would behave like this, OK? And Maybe it's not so interesting, but this, this experiment is important to say that, uh, uh, which we'll see later, that really uh, um, the amount of time you spend in this status as a bilingual or in this status may eventually have some repercussions on your brain. Language control is, of course, also highly influenced by uh, language proficiency. Okay? Like in this experiment of uh, Wang and Kul colleagues, uh, forward switching is much more uh, uh, difficult than backward switching, okay? Into the weaker language. And in another experiment uh, of ours done in Geneva, which is actually one of the few experiments done in comprehension, and that's also a very, very important uh, message of who of you, uh, of you want to really go into this field. 90% of data we have is on language production. Okay. And most of this 90% is really single word. Okay. And there are many linguists who actually say that single word is not language. Okay. But uh, 
listening to narratives, like in this case, is actually considered language. I hope you agree with me on this, at, at least, yes. But it's the same, this is a funny thing, that even, even in a totally different paradigm, as uh, listening to, to narratives, in this case, it was listening to short stories, uh, which were taken from Le Petit Prince, okay, the little prince, and uh, in which the story could change the language, okay, from Italian to, to French. The switch activates the same areas we have seen for those language production paradigms. Okay, you see, the, you see here the same caudate activity and the ACC activity here. Okay, so this language control network is universal for language production and language comprehension. And also here, uh, um, switching into the weaker language was associated to a much wider network of language control than not the reverse. What we have seen in all this year is that we always find two very, very highly consistent findings in our neuroimaging uh, uh, experiments. We always find the activity of the left codate and of the anterior cingulate cortex. So one question was if really these two areas are specific for bilingualism. Okay? In, in the case of the left codate, <coughs> we are really blessed with our patients, okay? Because subcortical structures are highly susceptible to uh, vascular disease, like strokes in the human brain, okay? So we also find many patients who have selectively vascular lesions, for instance, in the left codate. That was actually the first patient I, I ever observed. I was still a medical student. That's the reason why I came to this field, okay? It was a 74-year-old um, lady who was admitted uh, to the hospital uh, of our university by then and put straightly into the psychiatric department because no one would understand what she is actually talking, okay? They thought she has an acute uh, schizophrenia uh, crisis or whatever, okay? And thanks God they asked uh, uh, the neuro to the neurology consultant uh, uh, to come and check her, and, uh, but then it was my former professor, so he took uh, me with him. And then I realized this lady is, is not crazy. She's just mixing three, three languages. One of my two languages is Farsi, which is very close to Armenian. So I could understand, uh, well, this, this woman is uh, mixing English, Armenian, and Italian. Okay? So, and then we asked a CT scan, and what we saw is a very, very small lesion, which you see here, it's on the left side, uh, around the caudate nucleus. So this, this poor lady had not any more any control of her languages. Right? She would just mix everything, okay? Which is a good index of uh, language, the language control system is impaired, okay? And there are many other cases like, like her, which have, which have been described uh, in the literature. If you have some time, if I've finished uh, this part in time, in the second part we can talk about uh, bilingual aphasia, which is also a very, very interesting topic, okay? This is just another uh, uh, patient of, of ours, again, a subcortical lesion, and this young boy was not anymore able to, to control language output, okay? And in this case, it's even more interesting because switching uh, was not, because um, <coughs> his language output was not restricted only to pathological switching, okay? like you see here, but also to mixing, okay? Uh, language mix is actually a change of languages that, that occurs within one word, okay? And you, if you see here, uh, the boy says, ich hab gekreit, I cried, okay? I have cried, okay? But he uses the, uh, <coughs> the Dutch prefix, ge, which is linked to uh, the English verb, okay? And that's, that's very, very bizarre. We call this patholog pathological language mixing and switching, but I guess all of you know that uh, some language switching is even physiological, okay? In, in small infants, you know better than me, uh, switching is something uh, typical, uh, like till the age of two or three, usually children don't uh, realize that they are two different language systems, okay? So they don't keep them separate, okay? And um, it's interesting to know that um, the prefrontal cortex comes to full maturation around the age of two or three. And once that area comes to full maturation, usually the switching uh, phenomena <coughs> stop in, uh, in child uh, speech, except if the poor child doesn't know the item in the other language. So he will still use, uh, he still will still switch. And the other very important observation is in, uh, in aging, even in healthy aging, 
once the prefrontal cortex, which is one of the first areas going into physiological atrophy, uh, wins a little bit away, elderly subjects start to do uh, switchings. Okay? And of course, there are also societies in which language switching is totally common. Okay? I, don't know, I don't know about Barcelona, if you switch often between Catalan and, uh, and Spanish. Very much. Very much, okay, Very much. yes, yes. Like for instance, most of our subjects in Milan come from South uh, Tyrol, which is a German-speaking region of Italy, but they usually don't switch between, uh, between uh, German and, uh, and Italian. Okay? But if you go to other uh, pop populations like in the, in the Philippines, it's, that's so amazing. Uh, the official language is uh, Tagalog, okay, Filipino, and uh, the other official language or second language is English. And if you go at the ATM and you need some money, you have three options, English, Tagalog, and Taglish, okay, which is a mix of English and uh, Tagalog. And people really speak, speak like this. And uh, later when I explain you the adaptive control model, we'll talk about uh, those, those populations who frequently switch. Yes. Oh, because it's induced by a lesion, because the because the subject wouldn't uh, speak uh, uh, like this if he wouldn't have the young, lesion. Yes. Young yes. Yeah, yes. You, yes. Yes. Uh, this is uh, here. This um, bleeding in his, his brain. Yes. Yes. So in the case of monolinguals, is there is this area implicated? It's it's excellent question. Uh, it's it's implicated in uh, in naming, of course. Uh, it's not per se a language area. Uh, it's per, uh, hence, its lesion usually doesn't give uh, uh, problems in, in, in language. But there are some interesting papers. Um, there's a very nice paper, very old from uh, Kaplan also, and the other one from Derenzi, who showed that lesions of, of the caudate or of the thalamus uh, may lead to some specific uh, naming difficulties, like category uh, differences. One, one of the cases was really beautiful. It was a surgeon who had a specific naming deficit uh, for surgical items. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it, it may be involved in this, in this network that has, uh, that, that has to select the correct alternative during uh, uh, virgin ration. Well, that, that was going to be my next question. If it's an area that's implicated in inhibition. Well, you will see it now. I will, I will show you the next slide. Uh, uh, um, <coughs> there's a nice experiment in which we contrast bilinguals to monolinguals, and we, and we study that, uh, that area. <coughs> in the case of the ACC, uh, it's not so easy, because God has really created the most perfect area in our brain. Uh, it's difficult to find lesions in that area because it receives a vascularization from different branches uh, of arteries in the brain, so it's really protected, okay? So we, we, we don't have case studies to see uh, what a lesion in that area uh, would lead to, to what linguistic deficit uh, we would have. <coughs> so in order to study this, the uh, caudate and the ACC, we use this experiment here. In this case, we were not working with bilinguals, but we were working with trilinguals, okay, speakers of three languages. And the nice thing, the nice thing was that uh, one of the two second languages were, was a very highly mastered, highly, a highly mastered language, so it was a high proficiency, and the other second language, which I call here L3, uh, was a very weak language. So I can also study uh, differences of proficiency between different second languages, okay. And in the same experiment, we had also monolinguals. And the bilinguals, as you probably will understand, have to do this uh, picture naming task in which uh, the color of um, the picture would really uh, encode the language to use. Okay? And we had two separate runs. In one run, uh, I would ask them, okay, now you have to uh, name pictures uh, uh, in L1 and L2. Okay? They know which co what color to use. And in the other uh, run, we have two different colors for L1 and L3. Okay? And the monolinguals have to do a noun and verb generation task, okay? Because that's uh, the closest that can come to uh, language switching with, uh, in, uh, in bilinguals. It's not a perfect task, but I can do otherwise a switching task in monolinguals. So <coughs> they, did, they did all this uh, um, experiment, and then we measured uh, the both effect, blood oxygen level dependent effect in the caudate, the left caudate, and in the ACC, which you can see here. This is the one for 
the left co codate. And <coughs> as you see, in the context L1 and L2 switching, okay, switching L1 and L2, L2 engages a little bit more of the left codate. Okay? If I'm in a context where I have L1 and the weak second language, like L3, okay, L3, of course, needs much more codate activity, okay, because it has to inhibit stronger L1, which is prepotent at the time. But L1 production goes without any codate activity. I don't need it, okay, because I'm, I probably, because L3 is probably so weak that I don't need to actively inhibit it, okay. But the most interesting thing is if you see the uh, uh, blood um, oxygen uh, dependent effect of monolinguals, M here, there's a total deactivation, okay? So this uh, non-verb switching goes without any inhibition, without any uh, language control, okay? So in this case, I can, <coughs> I think, I can uh, trustworthy say that the correct activity is in some way specific to bilingual language uh, processing. A totally different story is uh, when it comes to the ACC, okay? <clears throat> the most important finding here, the most interesting finding is if you compare L1, okay, in both contexts to monolinguals, which is the L1, it's the same, okay? So it's really constant among uh, native language uh, production, switching into it, okay? But there's a difference for L3, the weak second language, I really have strongly monitor a weak language, okay? And it's less for a second language, a highly proficient second language, which is a very striking uh, uh, finding, and I actually have no, no clue why I need less activity for this highly proficient second language than compared to the first language, okay? It's very interesting, okay? But I find it really beautiful to see that for L1 here, L1 here, and monolingual, it's exactly the same. Okay? So what I can really say about the ACC, it is not specific. Okay? It is not specific to bilingualism. And we, we all use it during, <coughs> during language probably to the same degree. But if I'm a bilingual, one second, if I'm a bilingual and I use a, a, um, a not so highly proficient language, I need more ACC activity. Yes. Uh, do you have any analysis on the connectivity between these two areas, this knowledge with the Stanford A, so how like the zero and higher one there can speak to you? Yes, we have. Have you watched them? I may show you later, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I don't see you. <laughs> now I see you. Yeah, for for monitoring. Yeah. Well, I'm happy if you tell me. No, I'm, I'm just wondering because someone, I mean, because the L1 is so powerful. Do you think that if it had to do with like the you know when you have to inhibit the L1, then once you have to activate it again, you have to make a stronger reactivation. Yes, numbers. that would be right. But this this area has nothing to do with inhibition and activation. Okay. It's really only about monitoring, like uh, detecting potential conflicts, but it has nothing to do with really uh, conflict resolution. So the question would be, why do I need less uh, uh, activity for monitoring my second language? Um, by the way, this is really a highly fluent second language. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll talk about this also later, but in, in this case, I have uh, a German as first language and Italian second language. And the third language? The third language is English. English. Yes. How do we measure proficiency? How do we measure proficiency? <laughs> you ask better uh, all people here, I guess. Uh, <laughs> some of you are psycholinguist linguists. Not, um, we measure proficiency uh, with psycholinguistic tests like uh, uh, really batteries, standardized batteries. In this case, we, <coughs> we have also picture naming task, we have translation uh, task, and some standardized battery. But there, there is a really common pr procedure. As I mentioned before, I seldomly use self-reported questionnaires because I find them very subjective. But 
I have to measure them because uh, I have also I can also correlate proficiency to brain activity. So it's it's a very very important measure. More questions on this? <coughs> this experiment, which would we have done with uh, Professor Costa is too complicated to explain you, but I just uh, uh, maybe 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 you can do it, right? <laughs> the paradigm was really complicated, uh, uh, but I love the message of it, of, the, of this message, because it shows that uh, the language control system is really uh, divided into two sub, sub parts, and one of it is uh, the ACC, which acts a little bit as. Uh, you know, all Shelley's uh, SAS model, so it acts a little bit as a supervisory attentional system, okay? And of course, now is the question, uh, we come now to the, to the second part, okay? What relation is there, with what I've shown you now, to the so-called bilingual advantage, okay? Um, so I start with you. What is, in your opinion, a bilingual advantage? There's a huge discussion in the field, and people are killing for each other really on this. <laughs> Really, it became so unfriendly recent, <laughs> recently. <laughs> what is a bilingual advantage? Come on, I saw there are some people from Edinburgh here, so you must know these things. Maybe being a bilingual can prevent, prevent um, dementia? Well, that's a kind of advantage, of course. But you know, when, when people call about bilingual advantage, they always have something in mind. It's even not about aging, mostly. For me, this is the best advantage, and I will just keep it there. I can talk two languages, I can have more friends, I can have more social activities. That's a huge, that's a huge advantage in my life, actually. And probably I get even better jobs because I speak two, two languages. But usually in the field, but the minimal advantage is really uh, limited to this uh, really hotly debated issue of is a bilingual faster? Is a bilingual faster on an executive uh, 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 task than a monolingual? Okay. And there's a huge discussion in this field. And uh, also here in Barcelona, there are a lot of studies uh, done about this. Uh, I will talk about this, but of course, there are also some bilingual disadvantages. Do you know some of them? Vocabulary? Vocabulary size? What? What's that? Explain it to me. Yeah, but then this would lead to a so-called advantage. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't see that as a disadvantage. Uh, but uh, disadvantages, of course, as you said, uh, usually, but there are also exceptions to this, of course, but usually uh, the single lexicon of a bilingual is smaller than the monolingual lexicon, okay? But of course, the sum of two, two lexicons should be bigger than the monolingual lexicon. But in uh, whatever uh, simple naming task, a bilingual is, is always slower than a monolingual. Okay. Absolutely, yes, yes, okay. So, and, <clears throat> and this was called as a, a disadvantage. And it's also not uncommon to see that bilingual children uh, may be a little bit slower uh, during language acquisition, okay? Like, Fred, you will talk much better on this, okay? But there's this common, you know, uh, belief. Uh, but my point is, even if it's uh, six months slower or not, who, who cares? By the age of six or seven, that will be probably the same, and then uh, once they're 70, you have all these advantages coming out. <laughs> if I could just add, when you talk about children, it, it reinforces an earlier point you made. Yeah. You have to be very careful to consider both a, all, age of acquisition, uh, proficiency, and exposure, because you're, Absolutely, you're looking yes. at someone who's still developing a system. Or yeah. So all of those students matter. So when people talk about Yes. 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 That that's absolutely yes. Uh, so there are a lot of methodological issues with this, and uh, uh, Fred, you're you're totally right. And of course, I'm now over uh, uh, general, generalizing it, but um, you would see if you go now back to this discussion of cognitive advantage that um, like 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, most of the studies would report for whatever uh, age range that the bilingual is faster on those uh, conflict resolution tasks, okay? Even in, uh, in children, in young adults, in uh, aging subjects. But <clears throat> then a couple of years ago, uh, the field changed, okay? Researchers are starting re reporting uh, 
null effects. Okay, no evidence of uh, bilingual uh, uh, advantage in those tasks, especially for adults and also uh, for children. Okay, in the aging population, we still most of the papers show uh, advantages. Okay, and uh, Virginia Valian from New York City wrote a very nice uh, keynote article uh, on this topic in our in our journal, and she actually makes a nice uh, observation. Why do we still see advantages in the aging population, not anymore in the younger population? Okay, and her point is that uh, younger subjects are exposed to a lot of other different challenging cognitive activities that equally may enhance uh, cognitive uh, um, conflict, conflict control and all, the, all these things. While usually uh, the aging population, especially once uh, they retire, they don't use maybe, uh, they don't, they're not anymore exposed to so many other cognitive advantages, but if they still speak two languages, then the effect of language is much more evident in that population, okay? That's maybe one, uh, one uh, good answer to this topic. My point is actually totally different. I actually don't care about the cognitive advantage. Do you think that it, it makes any, it has any sense in our life if I'm 10 milliseconds faster in pressing a button uh, uh, on, on conflict resolution? It doesn't make any difference in my life, okay? I'm, if, if I'm slower, I wouldn't be considered a psychopath, I hope so. Okay. So, and, and, and the same also about the bilingual disadvantage. Who cares if, I, if I'm slower 10 or 20 milliseconds in naming a picture, okay? It doesn't make any difference in my everyday life, okay? So, yeah. So, do you see, like, um, you, like, are on Facebook or anywhere on the internet, like, you know, there's all these articles, all ways, like, opinionated, trying to say, what is a difference between a bad guy and a man? Yeah. Professor Abutalebi has learned a lot from uh, Professor Costa on this, uh, but is it on this because he has done some beautiful studies on, on this uh, argument, and uh, and it's true. Actually, um, Albert worked on some uh, studies like you make much more rational decisions in your second language because it's less affected by emotion. That that's right. And uh, Albert, you told me once that uh, someone in in Brussels in the European Committee m made this joke uh, about uh, all uh, British representatives because they are they are mostly monolinguals and and everyone else speaks English. Okay, so uh, uh, the decisions made by uh, mainland Europeans are much more rational than not the decisions by the British folks. And you see now with Brexit, I, I guess. So sorry for insulting anyone who comes from 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 Britain. It's just a joke. Okay? But but it's true. I mean, uh, you can ask later Professor Costa, that he has done a lot of studies, this. It's, it's true, yes. So, let's go back to the cognitive advantage, and because uh, I really like to tell you, because people usually tell me now, he is one of those guys who really uh, uh, is in favor of, of uh, the bilingual advantage. I'm actually not, okay? I'm much more interested what happens in the brain and not uh, at the behavior difference of 10 milliseconds, okay? And, the whole lesson will be uh, uh, about the brain, so you will see it later, okay? So, as I mentioned, I'm much more interested in, in uh, seeing what happens if we speak two or, or three languages uh, to the brain. Uh, the implications is that um, if bilinguals use much more those contour areas than monolinguals, some sort of brain plasticity should happen in our brain, okay? And bilingualism is not an exception, okay? Brain plasticity may happen because of many other activities, okay? If I do a lot of sports, I will have changes in my brain. If I, do, if I play a musical instrument, I will have changes in my brain, okay? So bilingualism is just one, okay, of those activities. And here I come back to the two uh, pictures you have seen, images you have seen before, okay? Like this was... Uh, a bilingual, frequently in a bimodal, uh, in a bilingual um, uh, mode. And this is also a bilingual, but uh, 
in a monolingual mode, okay? And I told you before that uh, this may have a uh, difference in the brain, okay? The amount of time you spend in, uh, with, a, with two languages or not, <coughs> and specifically for that. <coughs> I actually saw there's one poster talking about the adaptive control model. Who of you is presenting it? What's your name? You said it's still very contentious? You mentioned, you mentioned in your abstract it's still very contentious? No, I'd say that I have any data at all. No, maybe, maybe it's not you. I, I will check, check, check later, but it's just a joke. I don't, don't take it seriously, okay? <laughs> okay, so the model was actually uh, created to show that uh, um, different exper experiences have different uh, 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 implications on the whole control network, okay? Like this would be just a, a, a summary of, uh, of the whole network which you have seen um, before, okay? You see the speech pipeline in it and the control network. And in order to see actually how this network changes upon the context, we made a very nice experiment in, uh, in China, in Guangzhou, okay? Guangzhou is in uh, South China. Uh, and uh, uh, native language uh, is uh, Cantonese and not Mandarin, but of course uh, all, all people usually speak also Mandarin, especially in, in their working place, okay? And here we took um, workers from the University uh, of Guangzhou. The day before they were leaving for their one month summer break, holidays, and immediately this, the very day they came back from the holidays. Okay. And what happens during holidays? They're not anymore speaking Mandarin because they go to the families who live in, in, this, in uh, Guangdong. It's actually called the area where Cantonese is uh, the original language. So we have two different conditions in such an experiment. Uh, uh, before the holidays, they would speak equally frequently Mandarin and Cantonese. Okay. But when they come back from their one month holiday, they were much more exposed, up to 90%, to Cantonese and not to Mandarin, okay? So, if I started them before and after, I can see how, eventually, the brain and the control network adapts to, the, to these two different conditions, okay? It's very similar to the experiment you've seen before. I have a bilingual context and I have a monolingual context, okay? During the experiment, <coughs> our subjects had to tell us uh, some, some stories of what they have done the day before, at midday, at dusk, and at night, okay? So it's, it's really a, a um, speech uh, production uh, task, okay? What you see here is brain activity, okay, represented as bars in different areas, like the right, prefrontal cortex, by now you know it's involved in response inhibition, Broca's area, which is not a language control area, but it's a language production area, and left codate, which is the area that allocates control to the other areas, okay? And you have condition one is prior to the holidays, and condition two after the differential exposure. And you see some important changes, okay? L2 is Mandarin, okay, which is not a native language. And you see after the holidays, they drive much more the response inhibition area whenever they have to speak Mandarin, okay? Because they were not anymore so exposed, despite having an early age of acquisition for that language and being, of course, uh, fully professed speakers of it, okay? But the brain changes if I were not anymore so much exposed to it, okay? Just imagine, okay, uh, even in our native language, okay, if some of you you are from Russian, you go away for two years to the US, okay, and you speak a lot of English. The first day you go back to Russia, your Russian is not anymore so fluent like it was before, okay? You need just a couple of days, then it becomes the same, okay? Moreover, when I hear Russian speech, I can, uh, I think that English speech is good. What's going on? Perfect. <laughs> we are going to scan your brain. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing is, uh, you've find also differences in Broca's area, 
as I mentioned, it's not involved in language control, it's involved in uh, production, that the brain has to drive it much more after this one month period, okay? And the same we find also for uh, left code 8, which was actually more activated before for a native language, but after these holidays for the second uh, language. Another thing we did in this uh, study was to correlate language exposure, which we measured, okay, in condition two, to brain activity in Brock Broca's area, and you see there's a nice correlation, okay, and also to the, to the left uh, anterior cingulate cortex, okay. So in other words, really, the context in which we are, okay, the amount of, uh, of uh, influence we have from two languages makes, has a difference, okay, has an impact on the language control network. And the whole story of the adaptive control network was about that. It is, there's nothing to do with cognitive advantages, yes or no, okay. Uh, it's just only to, to explain how the control network is differently engaged and how it, it adapts to different circumstances. And in the original paper, we, we, ha we have three different interactional contexts, okay? And, of course, different control processes, because language control is not just language control, but as you see, there are different sub-components of language control, like goal maintenance, you have interference control, which includes conflict monitoring, interference suppression, salient uh, cue detection, selective response inhibition, task disengagement, task engagement, okay? Those are actually carried out by the uh, left, by the parietal inferior lobule, and you have this opportunistic planning, okay? In a single language context, like our subjects who were now <coughs> in holidays, okay, just speaking one, one language, <coughs> the, the two subcomponents mostly activated, okay, are goal maintenance and interference control, okay? While when we are in a context where we commonly use two languages, like it would be actually in Barcelona, okay, there's a lot of switching, like, <coughs> And as a bilingual context where you usually really change from one language to the, to the other, you have almost all of the subcomponents involved in language <coughs> control. Okay? That's why we activate it much more. Okay? In a dense code switching context, okay, which is the case, for instance, of the Philippines, which I made you before, where, where really people always switch so much that it almost becomes a single language. Okay? I don't use it anymore all the subcomponents. The only thing my brain uses is opportunistic planning, okay? Because in some way, the speech has to be planned in the subjects, okay? And we know in some recent experiments that this activity is actually carried out by the cerebellum, okay? That's the reason why we added this area to our new, uh, to, to the update of our, of our model. <coughs> you see it here, like, the, interac the interactional context, okay, translated now into the brain, would activate much more those connections, okay? While the dense code switching context would activate much more the pathway from the left, uh, from the right cerebellum to the left prefrontal cortex. <coughs> Well, in some way, if you if you re, uh, switch uh, constantly your languages, re, like it happens in the Philippines or other uh, uh, po populations, in some way you have uh, to have a sort of planning when to put uh, uh, the verb in what in what language, uh, uh, if you respect the constituents of a sentence or, or not, and, and this has to be planned in the brain. You have also other extremes, even a pidgin language as a dense code switching language, but. That would be the most extreme case in which probably the language is not anymore considered two languages, but just a single language. Okay? You know, if you look at uh, children, I may be getting ahead of things, but the children at a stage when they can engage in intra mixing within an audience, they, they also, they only code mix according to the graphic, 95% of the time, according to the grammatical constraints of the two languages. Yeah. So they virtually never if they have sufficient exposure to programs, they don't violate either the syntactic or morphological. Yes. So, yeah, this is going on very early, early on. It'll be interesting to, to, to study this in children, actually, yes. yes. Because they don't, it, it doesn't involve planning in the way one might think of planning as a thoughtful process in subconsciousness. 
exactly. It just goes uh, automatically. But you know, I don't have the evidence, but I would uh, suppose that probably it's also based on on their cerebellum in some way because it's 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 uh, structure involved in coordination and and all the things. So it may. I mean, it's yes. dramatic in children because they're still acquiring these systems. These are I'm talking about children who yes. are uh, 18, 24 months of age. Depends on when they start to combine words. But as soon as they start to combine words, you have to make uh, concessions for the fact that they don't know all of the constraints. Yes. But as far as we can tell, they just don't violate. They they certainly observe the word word order constraints if they differ in the two languages. Yes. They won't co-mix, for example, if the word order in the two languages is different. They only co-mix if, if the word order is the same. And if they do violate it, it's probably because there's a dominant language with in the context of the, using that. Yeah. It's, it's, oh. it, it's fascinating, actually. Uh, it's sort of a yeah. byproduct of yes. bilingual. It's also interesting to see then how, once they grow a little bit older, how they really start uh, separating it. Well, the, but the fact that they're observing them from the beginning means already that they're separated. Because in order to coordinate them properly, they have to be separated. Yes. Rest, right? yes. So they never confuse them. Yeah. These are simultaneous questions. Fascinating. <coughs> So we're coming up to this uh, um, study, which uh, is a study done in, uh, in India, in which we were looking for white matter differences between bilinguals and monolinguals. I'm not going into detail of the study, but I wanted just to sh show you uh, uh, that it looks so, so, so nice to see we have the same differences where we actually postulate uh, 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 um, the differences in the model, okay? So the, the very same connections in real life are much more, uh, in this case, bilinguals would have much more uh, uh, white matter in this, in this connections uh, than monolinguals, okay? And this, this bilinguals we studied are actually, uh, they live in a very, very strong interactional context in, in India. Uh, they speak fluently uh, Hindi and English, and, uh, and I don't know who of you have ever been in India, but uh, students actually really switch from one language to the other. It's not a dense code switching uh, uh, context, but it's a highly interactional context. And the result is really that you increase uh, the white matter, okay, for these connections. This is typical in Italy, all right? We accommodated to it, yes. Uh, it was just an example. We, we, uh, there will be a part on white matter and, and gray matter, yes. Ah, white matter? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, in the brain, I mean, our brain, except of the, of the liquor, we have uh, white matter and gray matter. White matter are all uh, fibers, actually, okay, connecting neurons, connecting the cortex and subcortical structures, while gray matter are actually neurons, like the cortex and those small subcortical uh, structures. So you see here, like all gray here are neurons, okay? That's the gray matter of the brain. Also some structures here. The white matter, it's called because it is less intense, okay, it's white, uh, are no cells, are just fiber connections, okay? So, and I can measure this, as I will show you later. I can measure the density of gray matter and the density also uh, of, of white matter, okay? And it's a good index of brain plasticity, as we will see. So we have this scenarios very often in Italy, okay? Uh, maybe also in Spain, I don't know, but I've never seen them in Germany, okay? You just, maybe you have someone who really, uh, was tummy ache, you have to bring them to the hospital, pop you bump in the street and you see those signs. Wow, where's the hospital, left or right, okay? So you have to make a, a very fast uh, uh, decision here, okay? Uh, just a real, real life uh, example of, for instance, the flunker task, okay? Which we, which we very often use for investigating uh, the so-called cognitive advantage or disadvantage of bilingualism. Um, the flanker task, as, as you may know, <coughs> the subject is asked to pay attention to the center arrow, okay? of a series of five arrows, okay? 
if the flanker arrows point to the same direction, okay, like the central one, it's called a congruent trial. Okay? If the flankers point to a different direction, it's called an incongruent trial. Trial, okay, and you can even have an experiment neutral trials. Okay, if I subtract congruent trials from incongruent trials, I have the so-called conflict effect. Okay, and it's a good index of uh, uh, conflict resolution. Okay, behaviorally. <clears throat> so it's and it's widely used to to study uh, uh, if a group of subjects is faster uh, than a different group of of subjects. Okay, there are a lot of other tasks uh, who who are based on on uh, on a similar uh, um, paradigm, like this assignment task and even the go no go troop task, they, are, they're all, they have all something in common in which you have to make a decision at least, okay? And what you measure is uh, accuracy and response time. <coughs> the brain areas involved in uh, such conf conflicts is essentially the same as you see here that is involved in language control, okay? So, and we can use such a paradigm also for our uh, brain uh, imaging experiments. In this, sh should we have make a coffee break? Because it was written at 11.30 as a coffee break? At uh, 11.30, not 10.30. No, what, what's the time now? 10.40. No, because my watch is wrong. It shows me 11.20, uh, just, just an okay. Okay, good. So we can still go on. <coughs> So we use this paradigm to, to compare at the brain level, okay, uh, monolinguals versus bilinguals. Again, our monolinguals were uh, fluent German Italian speakers from South Tyrol, uh, or bilinguals, and our monolinguals were from Milan, so monolingual uh, Italian speakers. And you see in this picture here that for doing such a task, monolinguals activate much more in the brain. In, especially you see here, the ACC and in the code 8, okay? And activating more during a cognitive task is, also, is always considered something more related to being effortful, more difficult, all right? Okay, because for, for the cognitive task, the less, uh, the less brain area you use, the more efficient your brain works, okay? It may not be the same for motor or sensory or visual task, okay? But for cognition, okay, it's really, uh, uh, the many studies have shown it, that the less you activate for a given task, okay, the better it is, okay? Of course, having the same performance like your control group. But the interesting thing is, we did this experiment in two separate separate runs with our subjects, okay? Each run was around 10 minutes long. We had, a, we, had, we had a lot of stimuli, even in one single run, to just analyze one run and publish the data, okay? And here you may probably see why I don't care about all this discussion about the cognitive advantage, but I'm more interested into the brain, okay? In this slide you see the first and second run of bilinguals, and the first and second run of monolinguals. This is a behavioral conflict effect, okay? Response times. If I would analyze and I've published only the first run of my experiment, I would say there's no difference, okay? Monolinguals, bilinguals are the same reaction times, okay? There's no difference, okay? And I would publish a paper saying there's no bilingual advantage, okay? And it, and it was enough. The data was really enough to, to publish it. You see a real difference only for the second run, okay? Bilinguals become faster. Monolinguals do not become significantly faster, okay? And the difference between the first and second run is significant in bilinguals, while it is not in monolinguals, okay? But I'm even not interested in this, okay? This may be, I, would, I could label it, bilinguals adapt better to conflicts, okay? Yes? You imagine uh, this experiment here, you, uh, we have more than 100 uh, trials of this in the last 10 minutes, okay? And then there's a two minute break, and then I do it again, okay? And of course, all trials are always randomized, but I run it again, okay? And what you see here is, is the effect of the second run, okay? So in one case, one group adapts better 
to a conflicting situation, and the other one not so much. Okay? But still, as I told you, I'm not interested even in this, but I'm interested in this, and what happens in the brain. Okay? The first run okay, in bilinguals as compared to monolinguals, okay? and keep in your mind there's no behavioral difference, nor in response times, nor in accuracy. Okay? But there's a huge brain difference. Okay? Bilinguals do not, not activate so much of their monitoring area, the ACC, as do monolinguals. All right? So this is, for me, a neural disadvantage, if I would use these uh, terms. Okay? In the second run, it becomes much more evident. Okay? It still gets a little bit less. Okay? But here, it's more extended. Okay? So the hampering little bit was, was here. And I can translate uh, this whole activity also in, in, in bars, okay? First run for bilinguals, as a little bit of the ACC, but it is much less than the first run of monolinguals. In the second run, it's actually not any more uh, activity. It's almost deactivated. They do it much more automatically, okay? But here you see still the, the activity. So just to summarize, I'm really more fascinated by, by this effect in the brain than not by this effect. <clears throat> Let's go now to some experiments done with structural neuroimaging, okay? which is, in my opinion, the most powerful tool to study uh, neuroplasticity. Because okay? it's not about brain activity. Okay? I'm not looking here for brain activity, but I'm looking for structural changes. And as I mentioned before, uh, structural change in the brain uh, uh, is related to increase or decrease of gray matter, where our cells and synapses are, uh, or to increases or decreases of white matter, where the fibers are, where the connections are. Okay? We can study this uh, very, very smoothly with some new fancy techniques. The first study that was uh, actually published by using this uh, technique, okay, which is called voxel-based morphometry, uh, was the study with London taxi drivers. Do you know this study? You never heard of this? You said yes, so you will explain to us. No, the woman behind you, yes, you. Don't look away, yes, you. <laughs> I have to keep your attention high. I will say so. Right hippocampal gyrus is our internal GPS, okay? So, and it makes a lot of sense that taxi drivers have developed really well in this area. So it's just, yes? I just wanted to ask for the context uh, why the study was in London taxi drivers, because to get the license, they have to learn to map by heart. And as far as I know, it's the only situation that has like a in their testing. In the emotional. Maybe to 
they probably a little bit different, okay? But by that, trust me, taxi drivers will know each corner of the, of the city, okay? So, and it makes really sense that in the area, the brain, which is responsible for navigation, is better developed than uh, some of the London taxi drivers. Yeah, but the London, I, there are not many cities in Europe that are as complex as London. So I think the difference between a taxi driver is a really manageable answer. Well, That's my It was a, it's, it's a beautiful experiment and it was the first to open actually this whole uh, line of research studying the effects of practice or experience uh, upon uh, brain structure. Uh, there, there are two different approaches actually for using this technique, okay? On the one hand, you can uh, get two groups, okay, who have differences in, in uh, in one skill, and you compare them on a whole brain basis, and you just see where in the brain is a difference, okay? And the other pr approach is a region of interest analysis, okay? That you just analyze one specific region of the brain, you extract uh, uh, the values of the gray matter, okay? And compare it between the groups. The second approach, if you do it, you must have, of course, a very, very strong a priori hypothesis. If not, no one will accept it, uh, accept it for publication, okay? Like we could do it uh, with a language control network. I could say, I want to see what happens in the left code eight. I would have a very strong uh, a priori hypothesis, okay? But the best approach is actually doing both of them, okay? In this case, in, in the same group of uh, uh, bilinguals and monolinguals of the previous experiment, the real whole brain difference was in actually the ACC, okay? Which makes sense. We saw also a functionally, with functional activity difference there. And I, if I would extract, okay, of that region, gray matter data, okay, I would see this difference. So this would be the region of, uh, uh, of interest analysis, okay? And another nice thing, uh, methodologically, which, which you can do, which is even nicer, so you study much better plasticity, is if you have behavioral data, you can correlate your behavioral data to gray matter density, okay? <coughs> In this case, as you see here, for both bilinguals and monolinguals, there was a nice correlation with gray matter density of the ACC in the sense the subjects who were faster on the flanker task had more, had increased gray matter density in that specific area of the ACC, okay? But the nice thing was uh, that this correlation was significant only for bilinguals and not for monolinguals, in a manner that uh, uh, gray matter density can predict performance of bilinguals, but not of monolinguals. The first study in our field, okay, uh, using this uh, technique actually, okay, with bilinguals I'm talking now, was actually done also in London by McKelly and, uh, and colleagues who investigated uh, a group of bilinguals and compared them to monolinguals. Okay? And uh, the nice thing, the nice finding was they found increased gray matter density in the left inferior parietal lobule which is this area here, okay? So you must know that uh, it's part of the control network, but it's also an area involved in, in, uh, uh, in the lexicon, okay? There are some nice studies showing that uh, uh, if you increase your lexicon, like word learning, uh, you have wonderful effects in that area, okay? So it's also involved in that, in that aspect, okay? And Something I have to say, uh, it's uh, always, because this paper was nicely published in, as a letter in Nature, okay, uh, calling this area as a, uh, as, a new, um, as a new discovery, okay, but this is the only negative aspect of it, because it's a very nice paper. We should always keep history in our, uh, not only heart, but also mind, okay, because we can learn a lot from, 
from, from history. The authors did not know that almost 100 years earlier, 80 years earlier, there was a German neurologist called Pötzl who published about this area and labeled it as the multilingual talent area. Okay? There was no mention of it in, 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 in this article. And when I spoke to him, he, he said to me, he, he didn't know this paper, okay? Um, by then, okay, this German neurologist, he observed uh, many patients in World War I, uh, the big war, okay, with bullet wounds to that area. If they were bilinguals, they could not, or multilinguals, they could not switch anymore, okay? And he and some, some other uh, uh, researchers after him labeled this area really as the multilingual uh, talent area. Okay? So but there was no mention of it in this paper, but it doesn't matter. It's a beautiful paper because they did something else, which is wonderful. They correlated language proficiency and, separately, age of second language acquisition to grammatical density of that area. And it, as you see here, the higher your second language proficiency is, the more gray matter you have in this area. On the other hand, okay, the earlier you learn your second language, the more gray matter you have in this area. Okay? I will talk about this later when I show you some uh, data on aging po populations. Okay? The other thing is, look at this now, I have to explain you this. Okay? This is a typical SPECT scan, okay? It's a method using nuclear medicine in clinics for making diagnosis of uh, people with cognitive impairment that may eventually convert into Alzheimer disease, okay? And there's a specific feature <coughs> that these patients have, okay? It's hypermetabolism of the parietal lobule, okay? The same area where bilinguals have increased gray matter as compared to monolinguals, okay? This is the area which really, if I see this on a scan, I know, oh, this poor old man will probably convert once into Alzheimer's disease, okay? So just keep this in your mind for the second part of my lessons, okay? The same area that McKelly has shown, and before him, Pötzl, uh, we found it, we found beautiful gray matter changes in a follow-up study with children, okay? These children were all multilinguals, again from South Tyrol, from the mountains, and they actually spoke four languages, because there's another, there's another language they speak in that region, which, which is Latin, okay? Latin is a sort of mix between uh, uh, French, German, Italian, and some really Latin roots, okay? It's, a, it's one of the three official languages of, uh, of South Tyrol. These children, when they came the first time to us, were aged around uh, 8.5, if I remember well, uh, and they spoke, uh, all four languages, they came back after a year, and what happened in this year is the proficiency for all four languages increased, which is normal because you grow one year, you have schooling, okay, and we used uh, the proficiency to correlate it. And what they did also was uh, both times, at time, the, uh, at time point zero and T1, so after a year, uh, we, we measured uh, their performance on the flanker task, okay, and we correlated. We correlated uh, we made an interaction between increasing language proficiency and increasing performance or better performance on the flanker task. And we found that the fact, the higher your proficiency became, the better you were on the flanker task, okay? And this specific interaction correlated only with one brain area, which is the same area you have seen here and here, okay? So in other words, in 1920-25, Pötzl was not wrong, labeling this area as the multilingual uh, talent area, okay? And imagine they had no techniques like we have today, okay? So it was a very, very uh, uh, acute observation. Yes. No, just one run. One, one run. Because uh, the problem is uh, uh, if you use uh, a group like, like children, okay, eight years old, two runs is too much for them. It would be 20 minutes. 
they would lose really uh, concentration on it. So just, just one run is sufficient. It's, it's really difficult. And yes, uh, with adults you can do it even with uh, uh, aging populations, but with 80 year old children, uh, two runs of a flanker would be really too much. I think, yes. Yeah, but, I know, and the other thing could be you could ask, okay, but within the one run you could compare the first trials to the last trials, but it would not be enough trials to, to, to make this uh, comparison. But your point is really uh, excellent. I mean, it would be interesting to see how children would adapt uh, to complex like the adults did, yes. Hmm? What, what? What about the Sorry, uh, for some noise. <laughs> yeah. Heavy attrition, yeah. right. What do you mean by language attrition? Uh, speakers who lose one language? Yeah. Okay. Um, we actually have, have no data about really language attrition in, in, in this field. Uh, but um, on the other hand, uh, we can make some statements about uh, bilinguals uh, who, especially during the Asian population, who are not any more exposed and less proficient in their second language than, than, than before. They lose. They lose their uh, uh, behavioral performance and also in the brain. And on that, I have some data that uh, I will show, uh, show later. But unfortunately, there is no study yet uh, that really studies like, uh, I, mean, I know there's a whole group of uh, uh, people studying language at attrition with very sensitive batteries, uh, linguistic batteries. But there's no study really uh, correlating the outcomes of those batteries to, for instance, brain activity or brain structure. But it will be highly interesting. Especially now, because we live in a, a world of globalization, there's also immigration, and, and uh, immigrants usually uh, lose one of their two languages, uh, their native language, and it would be nice to see even what effect that has upon the brain. This slide is just to show you that uh, even different kind of type of bilingualism has also an effect on the brain. In this, in this study, we compared bimodal bilinguals, right? so i.e. bilinguals who uh, use a sign language and the spoken language to uh, spoken monolinguals. And in that case, we find uh, uh, differences in the brain. There are many other studies, okay? Um, Yeah. Oh, no, the, yes, the point. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. I think it's really both. My, my opinion is really, it's really both because there is nice data that if you increase your proficiency, even functional later, uh, that uh, uh, it's correlated to the activity in the inferior parietal lobe. As there is also data on executive uh, functioning and the parietal lobe. I think it's really involved in, in both functions. And uh, of course, if you ask me, your subjects have they increased uh, gray matter in that area because of increasing proficiency or, or of increasing uh, 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 or better performance on the on the conflict task? <coughs> the answer is the interaction of those two correlated uh, to gray matter. Similarly, none of them. Did in, in, in our group. I also have forgot to tell you something very important because if you have such a follow up study uh, with children, uh, you have, of course, correct your brain data with, uh, with what happens during normal development. Okay? Because it's absolutely uh, uh, obvious that in a one year span, even in normal conditions, children will have an increase of gray matter. Okay? But you can calculate this this difference in the one year, and you have to correct them, uh, those those data. Wondering, yes. Uh, do you guys look at individual differences, like within the subjects, to look at whether people who, like, let's say, by default, are better at certain functional abilities, like those who may develop yeah. different? I, I will come later to individual differences. It's a very, very uh, brand new topic, and it's highly interesting. Okay? Uh, uh, we have some data, uh, which we are publishing now. Uh, to go together. It's very interesting, but uh, 
at that time, people wouldn't look, okay? Because the, the, the methodological approach was really, uh, you have a group of subjects, the more they are, the better it is because of statistical power. You just group them together, you normalize them to one template brain, and then, then you compare them to a different group, okay? But in this, of course, this approach, you don't look at individual differences. But don't worry, I have some data, nice data, in which uh, we look actually at individual <coughs> differences, which on, in turn, have some nice implications, okay? So, this slide is just to, uh, slide is just to summarize that there are many other studies done, okay? Uh, uh, um, that compare structurally bilinguals to monolinguals. And most of the differences uh, uh, um, people uh, report is some way correlated to the language control network, okay? And uh, from here, actually, we, is actually the, the, the connection what about the neurocognitive repercussions, okay? I use much more of this, these areas, hence I have more gray matter or white matter increase in this area, and may this one day protect my brain against cognitive decline and against brain atrophy on the other hand, okay? So two different aspects which we'll, which we'll see, okay? And here I answered your question about individual differences, okay? Before I go to the aging, okay? Uh, there's some evidence in the literature that uh, some subjects have a so-called parasimulate sulcus, okay? Which is, you see here this blue sulcus here, okay? The one in yellow is the singular sulcus, okay? Which divides the singular cortex, which you see here, from the rest of the brain, okay? On top of it. But some subjects have this parasimulate subjects, not all, okay? It may be present just, okay? It must be longer than two centimeters, or it may be even prominent if it's really long, okay? And the other thing is, in some subjects it is symmetrical, so left and right have the same feature of the sulcus, and it may be even be asymmetrical, okay? So there are some papers published in the last years on monolinguals, especially on, on children, that report that if you have a sort of asymmetry, it is associated to better performance on executive tasks, okay? Yes, it's very interesting, I was skeptical too, uh, because this feature, brain feature is actually, uh, or it's already present at birth, and it will not modify, okay? It's predetermined, okay? It's, Okay, against, it goes also against my own uh, uh, environmental beliefs and whatever, but it's interesting and we have to take it in, into account. So there are some nice works that show that really if you have an asymmetrical pattern, it is associated to better performance on executive tasks, okay? So uh, when uh, Professor Costa was once in Paris and saw a presentation of, uh, of these people doing this kind of research, he just wrote me an email, why don't we analyze our data was bilinguals and monolinguals to see this uh, circle pattern, okay? We did, and it's very, very interesting, the outcome. These are all individual subjects, okay? And look at this, okay? The same experiment you have seen before, the one with the adults, South Tyrol, in which we had two separate flanker sessions, okay? I must tell you, we had only very few subjects with uh, rightward asymmetry, only three, so we discarded them because there was not enough power. But we have enough uh, subjects with symmetrical patterns of the parasimulant circles and with leftward asymmetry, okay? We separated the two flanker sessions and for leftward asymmetry, monolinguals actually outperform bilinguals, okay? For symmetrical patterns, okay, of this parasimulate uh, 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 um, circles, bilingual, uh, bilinguals outperform monolinguals. All right, so this is very interesting. And in the second session, still monolinguals would outperform bilinguals if they have a leftward asymmetry, and the same direction as in session one is also for session two present for bilinguals. Okay, so it's highly interesting, okay? So we're starting really, uh, we're publishing this, but of course there's not yet a 
a solution to it, we need much more data. Okay? But it's a good beginning of what you actually mentioned, okay, if we look at individual differences. Okay? So the answer is actually not yet, we're starting to do it. Okay? I think this highly interesting data surely will uh, add much more to the, to the confusion that already reigns in this field, but that's fun, yes. I'm wondering if it, if it seems to be in, innate, is it related? This in, sort of implies that the body, I'm wondering what the implication in terms of cause and effect is, and I haven't thought it through, but is it possible that if, if you're born with this asymmetry, then that somehow or affects your executive functions, which in turn has some effect on your bilingualism, and there's, there's a, and this notion that it's the bilingualism that's creating. Yes, but, there, but, but there's another nice implication, because um, for now, the existing data on modeling was always reported that you were part of the advantage in the other assets, like the platform you see here in the, in the model, but the bilinguals do not have that. And, and one conclusion may be that maybe bilinguals can overcome the sort of uh, biologically given uh, cancellation of that's one of, one of the many ideas, uh, uh, right. but really, trust me, it's too early to make any strong uh, uh, supposition or conjecture actually on, on, uh, on this outcome. But it's, the point was really to look also on individual brain differences. But if you look, we look, of course, on individual cognitive differences, but we never actually looked on individual neural differences. So that may be the start of it. But as I mentioned, probably will add much more to the confusion that uh, we already have in, in the field. <laughs> Let's come now to healthy aging. Okay. <laughs> this is we're wonderful not coming, reaching the age of 100 years and being still happy and drinking, smoking and having fun, maybe whatever. <clears throat> so there's, of course, some uh, common sense in saying uh, that structural neuroimaging research, like the one you've seen before, is suggesting that during healthy aging, the human brain, um, like gray and white matter, is well maintained at, up until, I would say, uh, the age of 60, 70. Okay, it's, it's changing, okay? Because the older we grow, uh, we are much more also exposed to much more com cognitively ch challenging activities, so our brains are healthier and healthier. Maybe 50 years ago, uh, um, a 60-year-old brain would be much more uh, uh, atrophic than not today, okay? Because we have much more activities than, uh, 50, than 50 years ago. Just, just check this, okay? Like, um, uh, two different curves, one for white matter and one for gray matter, okay? Density and age, okay? In, uh, the decline of gray matter, uh, uh, which is age-rated, is, is very, very gradually going down, okay? while the one for white matter has, is actually a sort of, uh, it stops at a certain time, okay? And then it goes uh, very, very uh, abruptly down, okay? It's interesting to see that it stops at a certain time. Maybe because between the age, it's between 45 and 60, I would say here, uh, humans are at the height of their, uh, how to say, occupational activity. So you make much more connections by then, okay? You have a question? No, don't, don't, don't be like this, okay? <laughs> it, okay. Uh, and you see also here, uh, um, just comparison between a 20-year-old male and an 80-year-old male, uh, the brain starts, starts to go into atrophy, especially on the, pre, on the prefrontal cortex. The size shrinks a little bit, okay? That's totally physiological, okay? That's, what we call this aging. At the same level, behaviorally, age and cognitive function, okay, uh, we divide into four different uh, categories, like no cognitive impairment, okay, the older you grow, you may have some mild cognitive impairment, okay, that's when your grandparents cannot find easily uh, the words they want to say, the names of objects, of persons, okay, that's usually a mild cognitive uh, impairment, okay. If it gets much more severe, then you may have a mild dementia, which usually is a, a Alzheimer's disease, or 
there are also some other types of dementia. One is called frontotemporal uh, lobe <coughs> dementia, okay, because it selectively affects uh, the frontal uh, lobe and the temporal pole. And there's also a third entity, very, very common, which is called vascular dementia, okay. It's a, a cognitive impairment related to small, usually small vessel disease of the brain. So you have a lot of small infarctions of the brain. Uh, they don't give sign to nothing important like motor or language deficit, but you start having uh, memory problems, okay. And of course, if uh, uh, global cognitive functioning goes down, you can end up also with a severe dementia. Okay? And you can measure this, of course, uh, clinically. Stern from, uh, from New York is one of, I guess, the most uh, prominent scientists in studying cognitive reserve in the brain. Okay? In 95 already, he made this beautiful uh, suggestion that uh, the common clinical belief about dementia is that people who are better educated or who are more intelligent, okay, whatever, however you define intelligence, okay, they cope better with the onset of dementia, okay, in the sense that they are longer able to maintain a normal life, okay, compared to people who are less educated or less intelligent, okay, so there would be a delay of the onset, okay, but at the same time, he writes that paradoxically, once full-blown clinical dementia has developed, the more educated, intelligent people, okay, often succumbs to the disease more quickly. Okay, do you have any explanation for this? Use your gray matter and white matter. Yes. Not far away from the truth, but you formulated it in a way that I can understand. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> try to try again. <laughs> Made you, um, I will make you an example, okay? You have two different subjects, both 75 years old, and they have both the same, okay, the same uh, performance on cognitive testing, okay? The fact is that, uh, I just made this example, okay, we have two subjects, both aged around 75, uh, both have on cognitive testing, which you do in clinics, the same performance, okay. One of them is highly educated, like 15 years of schooling, one only five years of schooling, and what I was saying is that usually only the highly educated has much more brain atrophy in his brain. They're not the less educated, okay? You may f find this at first, it seems a paradox, okay? Because you would expect him to have increased gray matter, but it's not. It is, this is the very essence of cognitive reserve, okay? It means that he can probably, or she, compensate better the loss of cells in the brain, okay? And that's what all the story is about. Okay. But we will see this better in the next slides. <coughs> Look here, uh, on the epsilon axis we have cognitive status, okay? And uh, as an example of dementia, I just took here uh, Alzheimer's disease, okay? You have two different uh, curves, one for a person with low cognitive reserve, and I will show you what the definition of cognitive reserve is, and one with a high reserve, okay? So the person with high reserve comes later, okay, the dementia onset. 
but once he has the onset, it is faster than the person with low reserve. Okay. Let's go to the definitions, okay? I start first with cognitive reserve, okay? By cognitive reserve, we actually mean uh, differences in cognitive processes as a function of lifestyle, intellectual activities, and other environmental factors, okay? That can may explain differential susceptibility to functional impairment, okay? Like, say, education, occupation, okay? They may all have differences on cognitive performance. And cognitive reserve has, of course, also its neural basis, right? which can be uh, divided into brain reserve and into neural reserve. Okay? Brain reserve would be differences like in brain size or other quantitative aspects, like I mentioned before, gram matter differences, white matter differences, okay? That, ex that may explain okay, cognitive reserve. While neural reserve would probably be the neural basis of cognitive reserve that involves more networks. Errors are better connected. Okay? I usually div not, div not divide them into cognitive reserve, brain reserve, and neural reserve. I just divide them into cognitive reserve and neural reserve. Okay? And neural reserve has to be then distinguished by a different uh, uh, mechanism, which is called neural compensation. Okay? Neural compensation would be, uh, what was that? Someone has, someone has tummy ache. <laughs> then, uh, in neuroscience, you have also two different, different models. One is called the passive model, okay, that considers, again, brain measurements uh, uh, as uh, a substrator of cognitive reserve. And the other one would be the active model that emphasizes the use of brain networks effectively, like connections, okay? Better connections usually uh, uh, lead to better compensation, okay? <clears throat> one of the most widely technique used in uh, aging research is PET scanning, okay? Positron emission tomography. It is not as easily done as uh, M MRI scanning, also because it's, uh, it's very, uh, it uses uh, uh, a radioisotope, so it's also highly uh, dangerous. You can you do it uh, just each month just to check up, okay? Subjects get injected by a radioisotope, which can be linked to sugar, okay? Uh, or to other molecules. And with that, you, you, can, you can study um, you can study the metabolism of the brain. You don't, you don't study structure, but you study metabolism, okay? Uh, as you see here, or if you use some uh, radioisotopes who are linked to specific molecules like dopamine, you can study also in the brain where certain dopamines of pathway will, will work, okay? So in, in aging, you would have this typical, okay, pattern, okay? This is just in healthy aging, okay? that there's no hypermetabolism, okay, but the areas who are much more, you see decrease in percent, start uh, going towards a hypermetabolism are parietal areas, okay? You may wonder, I told you before, the first area, okay, going into atrophy is actually the, the prefrontal lobe, the frontal areas, but as you see, I don't have hypermetabolism here, okay? This is how we compensate physiological brain atrophy. There's a model called PASA, P-A-S-A, -A, posterior to anterior shift, okay? <coughs> During aging, much of the function that is carried out by brain areas in posterior areas will be shifted toward areas in the <coughs> frontal lobes, okay? That's the reason why I don't have here hypermetabolism. I may have brain atrophy there, but not hypermetabolism, okay? Because this area compensate the loss, the physiological loss of what happens more posteriorly in the brain. PET is used now since more than 25 years, okay? And it provides us with specific metabolic patterns for not only dementia, but also healthy, healthy aging, okay? This is a typical uh, uh, PET analysis of Alzheimer's disease, okay? 
you see specifically, this is not activation, this is really hypermetabolism. Okay? It just uses the same software, but it's not uh, activity. You see specifically, we have hypermetabolism in both parietal lobes. Remember the same area of McKinley, language talent area, okay? This is typically seen in Alzheimer's disease. Okay? Um, just a case study in a probable Alzheimer's disease, okay? Probable means that his clinical pattern doesn't allow us yet to make any certain diagnosis, okay? But if you see the pattern with, with PET, you see already here, there's less metabolism, okay? With this software, it looks, looks like this. It's almost, almost sure that uh, he has not only probable, but uh, certain Alzheimer disease. Okay? We use it also for different kinds of dementia, like frontotemporal dementia. In that case, the hypometabolism is not in, post in posterior areas, but it is more in frontal areas. Okay? That's why this dementia is called frontotemporal dementia. You see it here. So it's a very nice technique, and at the end uh, of uh, this part of the lesson, I will show you also an experiment we did with bilinguals and monolinguals, Alzheimer patients, by using this uh, technique. Just to show you how a brain looks, a brain from a frontal temporal dimension looks like, okay? You see this is a frontal lobe. It's almost uh, really cranked really down, okay? You see it also some temporal areas here are missing, and this would be his uh, MR scan. This is not normal, of course. And I mentioned this uh, before with the other uh, slide you've seen when I was talking about the parietal area. Uh, PET is used successfully in actually predicting, okay, there's a good correlation, okay, it's not 100%, but it's almost 95%, okay. In those subjects who have a mild cognitive impairment, it may predict who of them will convert or will not convert into Alzheimer's disease. Keep in mind that whenever we have uh, subjects with mild cognitive impairment, uh, typically half of them may convert into one day with a worsening into Alzheimer's disease, but not all of them, okay? Some will always remain uh, uh, mild cognitive impairment. Katarina. Katarina, I have recognized you. Welcome. <laughs> we met in Hong Kong, so she did the PhD in Hong Kong. So, yes. Say so your question again. I was just uh, wondering. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so since you're talking about physiology, could you please make uh, a comment about the difference between the brain function and the brain function? Genes. Genes. Wow. It's a pity because I had a lot of slides on that and just discarded them because I thought it was too not appropriate for here. There, no, there, there are also uh, predictive powers of uh, uh, APOE is the gene in, in question, okay, with specifically labels for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it correlates uh, not only with PET data, but also with cognitive reserve. Okay? There's some nice studies really uh, 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 showing these uh, beautiful correlations. Even, even for who will uh, convert or will not convert. But I really, uh, yesterday night, uh, then I discarded all slices uh, with genes because it was, uh, I didn't know she was such into medical field now. Okay. Coffee break? All right. All right. Um, before I restart, uh, is everything fine? Everyone is following? Especially those of you who haven't made any question. Do you want to ask something? Now is the right time. I'm here. You made a lot of questions, but you can make another one, yes. No, you, you made a lot of questions, but, but you're welcome. But also, who hasn't made any question yet? Just ask. Please. Bilingual context, so how much the brain is um, exposed and 
from activated. And I was thinking, okay, let's have one effect and then to develop more brain matter, more neuroplasticity. But is there a question of energy, like of fatigue, like do my lymphos require themselves more easily? More easily or more difficulty? Like, yes. More easily. Like well, I think it's. Your brain would get more tired. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, isn't there a saying that you gain nothing without uh, effort? So. No, no. I mean, it's 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 a good question, but uh, the answer is actually, of course, uh, uh, it's probably more tiring, more effortful controlling two languages. Okay. That's on the one hand why you're slower on language. Okay. But uh, you have some advantages maybe on the long-term effect. I think uh, we maybe all agree that uh, as a multilingual, if you speak one of your languages, you, you surely struggle a little bit more than a monolingual who has no interference from no other language. So, and uh, try you to speak uh, uh, a whole day in your second language and also in your first language, it is tiring. That's what I advise you to three Yes, say. okay, yes, yeah. it's tiring, yes. Yes. So, but what does it mean, this tiring? That you use a lot of uh, those control areas in your brain, uh, but because you use it, it's like a muscle, okay? Even, even if they always say, don't compare your brain to a muscle, but in some, in some instances, you can compare it. You use a lot those structures, so uh, physiolo physiologically, they have to develop better. You, you make more synapses in that structures, so you develop them better. Even. Even driving around London with a taxi is something very tiring. If you, you can ask every taxi driver, it will tell you it's, tire, it's tiring. But then they have one area in their brain which is better developed. Okay? So, and in real life, it, it would mean if you get a taxi driver and a normal subject, you, 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 you get them, you leave them out in the jungle, probably the taxi driver will more easily find its way back than not the normal one, because that's his advantage. He can orient better. Okay? And in, in the bilingual, probably it is that uh, the brain is better protected. Okay? I'm not uh, stupid enough saying he, he maybe resolves conflicts better because uh, we don't have anymore so many evidences for younger ages. Maybe as an, uh, uh, someone elderly, yes. Okay? But the real life really uh, uh, outcome is then your brain is better adapted to, to deal with uh, conflicts. But you have to go through a stage in which everything is difficult. Questions? From someone who hasn't made any questions. Do you want me to ask you questions? <laughs> no, you're laughing. You. No question? Everything is clear? Yes. This one's here, yes. These are the converters and non-converters, okay? And they have the same uh, mild cognitive uh, Im impairment, okay, to the, to the same degree. But if you have the PET pattern uh, of those subjects, you're almost sure, but there's, n there's no 100% certainty in medicine, okay? But you're almost uh, quite sure that uh, they will probably develop one day into full-blown uh, Alzheimer dementia. Yes? Yes, but even even not in real life. I mean, uh, in general. You don't know. You don't know how those milliseconds in the lab translate. Or you are outside the lab. Perhaps it translates to a larger one or to a smaller one. We don't know. Yeah. The fact that in very simple tasks, there are differences between molecules and molecules. Very very simple tasks suggest perhaps that the real world that these are more complex, more confusing. You're right. No, it's it's an excellent question. Actually, uh, uh, for me, uh, the milliseconds probably doesn't make they don't make any difference in my real life. 
But uh, as we will see later, if I have a delay of dementia onset of 4.5 years, that doesn't make only a difference in my real life, but also of your government. Right. Yes. So you are back then to be here. I'm, no, well, yes, yes. It depends what you mean with behavior. It's, well, it's a, yeah, yes. Yeah. yes. No, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's complicated, okay. Uh, you've seen it from one of my, of my, of my slides. The, uh, the most dangerous thing in this field is always to, uh, to presume that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between behavior and brain. It simply is not like that. There's no one-to-one -one relationship between brain and behavior. Not all differences in behavior are reflected by differences in brain and the other way around. And we should always keep this uh, in mind. I, I think the, the effect of speaking two languages is, is bigger, is higher in the brain than not on behavior. Of what? Yeah. Than a person that does, that speaks only one language. Well, maybe you don't care, but uh, I, sh I think the, your loved ones would care about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, of course, I know, I know what you mean, of course, but uh, behavior in some way comes from the brain, even if there, there is no one-to-one -one relationship. But uh, my point is when I say I don't care about uh, uh, the small behavioral differences, because for me, by then, in younger ages, and I was talking about children and, and young adults, uh, it doesn't change my life if there are milliseconds of differences between uh, uh, two groups. But for aging uh, subjects, it, it is important, even behavioral differences. And this is what I'm actually talking about. So, uh, but since 80% or even 90% of that literature and science is really on adults and children, okay, my point is uh, I won't lose any more of my time and effort in, in study, studying uh, with those paradigms uh, differences in bilinguals and monolinguals. Something I haven't told you but I mentioned now, it will be even useless today, in my opinion. Look how our, life, our lives have changed. Even if you compare it to 10, 20 years ago, we all now use uh, uh, phones, video games, and, and whatever. And the effect okay, of the use of multitasking okay, of phones is as potent as bilingualism is. So how can we now com compare? Uh, it's, it's really it's the strongest confounding factor we have in, in this field, all these other activities we do. And it may be as potent as bilingualism, as languages is, or even more potent. There are some nice studies showing that uh, if, if children play four or five hours video gaming, that's a powerful boost of their executive functions. I'm not telling now that we should tell our children to play four or five hours video games, but, but just to see that this is another exper uh, uh, exper exper experiential activity that has a powerful impact on executive functions. If it harms or not, we will see in, in the future. But my fact is languages, okay, it's difficult really, to, to find the subtle differences behaviorally in younger uh, populations, okay? But it may be important for, for the aging population. Is this clear or you're still? It is clear in this room. You, is it, well, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give you a grant, 100,000 euros studying if bilinguals or monolinguals are faster. Why would you do this now? No, oh, it's a, nice, it's a nice discussion. I hope it would end up like this, but why would you do this? Uh, that's okay. That's good you. No, it's a question also to the audience. I mean, I mean uh, tell me your opinion about uh, the bilingual advantage, cognitive advantage. Well, if you're only studying, Two comments, one on whether we care or not. In, on the educational side of what I do, where I worry about the discussion about the so-called bilingual advantage is that, and maybe this is a North American phenomenon, not, maybe not so European, that you have uh, parents who are thinking about sending their children to a bilingual program or not, and they're often much more concerned about the cognitive advantages their child will get than the ability to communicate in two languages. I sort of say to parents, 
I don't think you should worry about these cognitive advantages. Yeah. What your child is really going to get out of this experience. We started with this, the whole lesson started with this comment from uh, someone here in the front row uh, that uh, when I asked what's, what, what are the advantages, and thanks God, that person hasn't said cognitive uh, advantages. It just said it's it's useful being able to speak into into languages. I can communicate with much more uh, different societies. I, my working chances, opportunities, they increase because I speak uh, more more languages. And whenever we, we actually uh, uh, talk to parents, as, as you do a lot, we actually uh, are much more focused on that. And we also know that f cognitively, not talking about language, but cognitive functions. It doesn't give you any disadvantage being being bilingual. So that's the most the most important thing. But also by looking at the, these uh, admittedly sometimes small millisecond differences in bilingual brains versus monolingual brains, these are really the, if we want a theory of how the brain works or how languages learn, we have to look at all language learners and, and yeah. the experiences. And I think it's the discrepancy between behavior and the brain that's really interesting because often it shows you how flexible the brain is because it can use alternative systems or strategies yeah. to achieve the same thing. So bilinguals, this notion of bilinguals being better or worse, which is the way people used to ask yeah. this question, is now being reformulated is how does the monolingual brain work? How does the bilingual brain work? So we're getting much more sophisticated in the way we think about these issues. Yes. It's not just the same and different and better or worse. And there's where you see yeah. small differences actually can be important, I think. Yeah. Someone else on the bilingual advantage? Yes. Yeah, I was I was thinking that it's like, very important to remember that like any results of this study has some kind of implications like in terms of um, education, uh, and of course uh, it is often the case that the results of research is not very well translated into what actually goes later into the public and uh, what results in various policies. Um, well, uh, quite recently I heard a talk by Gigi Luke who was uh, talking about maybe it doesn't make sense to talk in terms of like advantage and disadvantage because if we uh, talk about advantages and disadvantages and compare bilinguals to monolinguals, there is always one group that is worse than the others, right? Yes. So why, why should we do that? But as I understand it, uh, the whole discussion of bilingual uh, advantage uh, be began because like in the beginning of the 20th century, there was this um, widespread belief that bilinguals actually do have lower IQ and you know and are slower to learn and so on and so forth. And uh, I think that this belief still uh, holds valid in some communities. Uh, like even even today, uh, there are schools where teachers prohibit children to talk among themselves in their minority language. There are parents who really try to make the decision, okay, if we live in the US and our home language is Polish, should we care about the Polish language or whatever minority language? Or maybe the child will not need it anyway and it's important to focus on the majority language and so on and so forth. So, so, so I guess um, what the discussion about um, the advantage brings us is, is just to um, make people aware that you know it is not worse to be bilingual. Yeah, no, I couldn't have said it better. Perfect. <laughs> no, it's it's true. I mean, uh, but uh, I think, thanks God, there are less and less people who still have uh, those old thoughts. Because I I see how how it's changing. Uh, I don't know about North America, as you say, but in Europe we just have much more bilingual schools, uh, bilingual education. So people are becoming aware. But as you say, you probably still find people who are against it because they still insist of concepts from uh, really hundred years ago that it would lead to. Uh, actually a uh, cognitive impairment. Albert? People believe what? Yeah. So, of course. Right. 
to. We care about what is good or bad for society itself. We care about what the data says. Don't read data that is convincing. I don't believe you. That's it. I don't care what you believe. Are you very confused? Sorry. This side. <laughs> what do you think about all this? You. What's your opinion? No, behind you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you were sleeping all the time. Good. <laughs> well, you can tell us. Yeah. You. Yeah. What? what? Quantifying the quality of exposure. Oh. Um, so, you could, so you could measure the length of exposure. Well, you cannot really measure the 100%. Okay? You use uh, questionnaires and uh, uh, you, you ask the subjects, for instance, uh, about the daily activities, how much time they spend in one language, how much time they use the other language. And you can do it also retrospective. but. It's difficult to have a real, really objective measurement of uh, of exposure. It's not like proficiency where you have tests that you can do. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, yes, yes. And another difficulty is to find uh, objective measures of uh, how often you switch languages. Because you've seen it, it has an impact on uh, the whole language control areas. But it's, it's really difficult to, to have an objective measurement of, uh, of uh, how often the subject switches. Okay? You, can, you cannot just tell someone, okay, come, come to the lab, I'll make an interview with you, and I see how often you switch. Because already when a subject comes in the lab, uh, he, his brain is influenced to use with what language you, you speak with him. Okay? It's something that has to be observed some, I don't know, more empirically, probably, or in some more natural setting.
Yes, and no, and, and we have we have to study those variations, and uh, we can study them, and we can even uh, uh, correlate those variations to variations of the brain, for instance. What? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think because uh, in the main problem, in everyday life, for example, language comprehension is a very, very fast uh, process. And uh, milliseconds are important. And if we see this 200 millisecond difference, it makes sense. So would it, be, would it be safe to say that behavioral methods in milliseconds are, uh, can be used for some measures? and? Uh, Well, I never, maybe it was misunderstood, but I, I never said that behavior is not important to study. As you, as you see in all our experiments, we always uh, correlate behavioral data. It is, it is important to have behavioral, behavioral data. Brain data alone, they tell you nothing. But you have to have behavioral data uh, uh, to, to correlate to, you, to your brain, because you want to make some statements on behavior from, from your brain uh, data. My point was much more uh, really focused on, on uh, all this executive functioning differences between bilinguals and monolinguals, differences milliseconds, that I find it uh, just uh, wasted money uh, um, doing a lot of experiments on this. Unless, as uh, correctly Albert says, uh, someone should do experiments showing that bilinguals are worse on uh, general intelligence or cognitive functions. That would be something uh, nice to study, but maybe someone has tried, but uh, there was no real uh, outcome. Um, Exactly. Yes. Exactly. But I understand. I mean, uh, in in other cognitive domains, milliseconds can make differences. I know. Yes. So I'm not really. Don't get it as a message. I'm not against behavioral data. Uh, I'm absolutely in favor because we do it too, and uh, I like to correlate them to to brain. Always keeping in mind that you, you, uh, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between brain data and behavior data. Okay, not not always they really fit into it. Because, uh, as Fred actually said, the brain may use different uh, strategies for coping with the same behavior. Okay. Uh, and you see it in, especially in, in our, our aging uh, population. Take as an example what I told you before about you, you have two subjects. Both have Alzheimer's dementia, uh, same age, uh, same uh, performance or cognitive testing, but one has a, a lot of uh, uh, um, brain atrophy, hypermetabolism, and the other one not. So uh, there wouldn't be any one-to-one -one relationship between brain and behavior. The behavior is the same, but one is really not uh, working in the same way in this brain like the other. It means the brain uses different strategies. It compensates for the loss. Okay, it's just as a simple example that really there is no one-to-one -one, uh, 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 relationship because the brain has uh, can use other strategies for dealing with the same problem, behavioral problem, and that, that makes us all different. Yes, no, it's, this is an excellent uh, question, uh, but with the methods we use, you, you it's very difficult to detect this because that goes really more in a molecular basis of, uh, of behavior. But then you go much more into the field of psychiatry, really the molecular basis, because of, of course, surely all of our thoughts and behaviors, if they change, something changes also at the molecular basis.
but uh, that really goes uh, far away from uh, from my topic here. Really, but one can study it, and there there are studies uh, studies about this. But that's more not because whatever I'm doing here is, is more the macro anatomical uh, field. You really have to go into micro anatomical uh, uh, stuff to to Im investigate that. Everything fine? So I go on. <coughs> Protective factors. We we mentioned them before. Okay. Uh, for building up the cognitive reserve, like education, occupation, cognitive, physical, and social activities, how they may influence uh, brain reserve. Look at this experiment done many years ago with uh, the first types of uh, PET sc scanning. Okay, this is this, the thing I just mentioned uh, before. You you have uh, three different patients here, for instance. Okay. They all have different levels of education. Uh, high education, okay, above average, uh, a graduate, so it's also high education, and this is a low education. And and in blue you see the hypermetabolism in the brain, okay? And the subject with the highest education has more brain damage actually. Okay? But the performance is is the same. You see the, the example I made uh, before, okay? You have two subjects, they're the same age, both have ultimate dementia. And here, in this case, the mini mental state examination, which is a brief cognitive battery of evaluating global cognitive functioning, highly used in dementia, is actually higher for this subject with 15 years of education as compared to the subject with five years of education. But if you see if the pattern of, uh, of brain, okay, you see better here. It's all hypermetabolism. It's much higher in this subject. I.e., it stands for he is compensating better. Okay, and this is even more important because 23, the score of 23 is actually uh, the cut-off level. Below it, it's called already dementia. Ab uh, above it, from 23 ab above, it's just only mild cognitive impairment, and from 27 onwards, it's normal performance. Okay. So, despite having much more brain atrophy and hypermetabolism, this subject has still almost non-dementia-like cognitive uh, profile, okay, compared to, to this subject with only little brain atrophy, okay. Don't you think it's also because the mini is so thin? The mini is just one example, but uh, uh, we have so many different cognitive uh, batteries, it takes almost two hours to investigate them. And, and they all go in the same direction. It's just for for easiness of, of uh, communication, we always uh, use the mini-mental just for saying there are also others like, like the MOCA and others, uh, but they all go in the same direction. Because uh, the issue here is just to show that uh, education can make this difference. The different uh, uh, difference in education, you can compensate better. So it's, it's a cognitive reserve. <coughs> This was a very nice study done uh, several years ago called as use, or, use It or Lose It, okay? in, in which the, the authors studied okay, uh, um, aging populations who frequently played board games such as chess, checkers, backgammon, and so on, okay? and compared them to, to match groups of uh, elderly people who, who did not. And, and as you, you see, even in this, in this case, the proportion surviving free of dementia is higher, okay? So this is also some sort of uh, cognitive uh, activity, okay? Intellectual activity that uh, may delay the onset of dementia or even uh, slower the progression of dementia when one has a dementia. You know, it's almost common sense when, <coughs> when we have uh, elderly patients coming in uh, to the ambulatory and the family asks for advice, what can we do? There's something common sense, you always tell them, oh, play, uh, play games, make uh, uh, chess or other uh, board games, so Sudoku and all these things, uh, because it, in some way it stimulates your brain, okay? And there's now plenty of data showing that it really delays the, the progression. <coughs> 
now we come back to the fact of bilingualism. Okay, uh, you have seen this uh, this this image uh, before. This was a paper of 2005 uh, by Bialystok and uh, her Canadian uh, uh, colleagues, just showing that uh, by that time there was a, always a bilingual advantage even for younger groups. Okay, but the point of this of this uh, uh, graph is that if there is a, a difference between bilinguals and uh, monolinguals, this becomes even bigger with aging. Okay? As, as you see here, maybe these are some 30, 40 milliseconds, but here it's more than two, 300 milliseconds. Okay? So, so maybe the real effect, the real cognitive, real behavior, okay? so you don't kill me, the behavioral effect of bilingualism is, is evident uh, only in the aging populations. As, as I mentioned before, Virgilia Valian uh, made this beautiful statement, probably because they are less exposed to other confounding factors, i.e. other uh, stimulating activities on co cognition. <coughs> Let's read some facts together okay? uh, about dementia. The first paper that came out uh, uh, in this field was still by Bialystok and her colleagues, in which uh, they've shown in a retrospective study that bilinguals develop dementia with a 4.5 year later than monolinguals, okay? And that did a huge impact. It was all around all mass media and all the things. And it was uh, confirmed in uh, subsequent studies still from the same Toronto group, uh, who confirmed the same findings, the same age delay, 4.5 years, in a different group of uh, dementia patients. Kavi and colleagues uh, published in uh, 2008 a paper in which they made this beautiful association uh, in which the number of languages spoken was associated to increased cognitive functioning in healthy elderly individuals. I.e., if you speak uh, five or six languages, it is uh, more powerful than if you speak two languages. Okay? While two languages would be more powerful than speaking one language. However, then <coughs> some criticism uh, arose in this field, uh, saying that many studies maybe did not take into account different ethnic backgrounds, okay, because there are always uh, differences between, for instance, immigrants and the local population. Uh, other factors were not often taken into consideration, like education, lifestyle, and diet, and so on. Uh, Howard Cherkov uh, uh, um, uh, mentioned that uh, it's also very difficult in many cases, in many studies, even the, the one from Toronto, to separate the effects of bilingualism from the effects of immigration. And uh, Golan and colleagues in San Diego uh, found that this advantage, this bilingual advantage in the elderly population uh, was found only in low education bilinguals, but not in high education bilinguals. So in other words, education may be, uh, uh, must be a factor that we have to take into account when we compare two different groups, like monolinguals and bilinguals. The hot known colleagues uh, published a paper in 2014 in New York City in which uh, uh, they reported bilingualism uh, has no effect okay, on cognitive decline or, or dementia in New York City. Okay? Uh, I was making this funny joke, I have to mention that the hot is also the only one who published a paper in New York City saying that education has no effect on, uh, yeah, it's funny. Maybe, you know, we had a nice discussion about this. Uh, maybe in New York City you will never get effects because they just live in New York City. I don't, I don't know, uh, but, <laughs> but even, uh, I know from uh, Lorraine Obler and Virginia Valiant who did some studies uh, bet between comparison between bilinguals and monolinguals in whatever age range, they don't find differences in New York City. <laughs> maybe it's already such a uh, challenging city enriching that, uh, it's enough to live there to have all the best effects in, in, in the world. But with uh, this paper from Zahotne, I mean, it's of course possible that uh, there are always studies that don't report uh, no effects. And it's good that we, that, that we have them because it makes us to just look deeper into the whole pot. But then uh, we got this huge study done in India by Aladi and Thomas Bach and uh, colleagues, which was done in over uh, 600 subjects. And the authors observed that bilinguals and monolinguals from the same autochthonous population uh, were studied, hence elimin eliminating the confounding factor of uh, immigration. The funny thing and interesting thing is that they report the same age span of delay, 4.5 years. 
in a totally different part of the world. So this is really interesting. And this effect was not only found for Alzheimer's disease, but also for other types of dementia, like uh, frontotemporal dementia and also vascular dementia. Okay? And the authors were also able to do a separate analysis on a subgroup of illiterates. And uh, the effect was even larger, six years. Now, this doesn't go far away from the study of Golan, who says the effects are more powerful in low education by language. Okay? And as they report, uh, six years. In the meantime, there were also some other studies, okay? like uh, A.B. Woman's uh, published a study in which she also report, uh, I don't remember if it was in Belgium or Luxembourg, uh, the same, what? Belgium, Belgium okay. Uh, the same effect of 4.5 years of delay. Okay? And as we will see later, we have also uh, our own study on Alzheimer dementia, and we found also an effect of five years. So it's amazing, I mean. Uh, just consider five years delay of dementia, what this means. I told you before, the best drug we have on the market eventually may delay uh, or slow down the, uh, the progression of dementia for six months. Okay, for five years, that's billions that we would save if uh, everyone would be bilingual, okay? But as I will show you also later, it is not enough to be simply bilingual, okay? This, I will end this whole lesson with this message that it's not enough to be bilingual. You must have certain, uh, so you must meet certain conditions to have those, uh, those effects. <coughs> The first study actually uh, investigating aging brains in bilinguals was still done by the Toronto group uh, with a DTI study, uh, Diffusion Tangent Imaging. They study uh, white matter. And the authors report that bilinguals have uh, increased, aging bilinguals, healthy, have increased white matter uh, densities uh, in the frontal lobes, especially. And remember, the frontal lobe goes into atrophy, but it is the area that uh, compensates for all, for all loss. Just a brain showing frontal lobe atrophy, okay? And bilinguals probably have some areas better connected. I will show you now some experiments uh, we have done in um, mostly in Hong Kong, okay? As you see, Hong Kong is a beautiful city. Uh, we have good food, okay? good lifestyle, it's very rich. Maybe after, it was after six months, it becomes boring, not to. <laughs> but it, after, okay, three years, okay. Uh, but it's the best place to find bilinguals, okay? And you have even different types of bilinguals, okay? The classical uh, Hong Konger would be a Cantonese-born Chinese subject who speaks perfectly English from kindergarten age, okay? And then you have a more recent type of bilingualism which uh, comes from mainland China, mostly all uh, people immigrating to Hong Kong. And many of them are uh, first language Mandarin, speakers who learned Cantonese in Hong Kong, okay? So you, you might find a lot of people. In this, in this study, we had 36 uh, uh, Chinese-English uh, bilingual subjects, okay? You, you will later see that we have also some Mandarin Cantonese uh, subjects. It's a study on, uh, on aging. Uh, we assessed all the things you see here, the social economic status, the uh, picture naming task uh, in order to investigate proficiency, Likewise, a translation task. Uh, we had also a self-reported questionnaire for language background. All of them were matched uh, or studied for education, social economical status, as I said, and mini mental. And they all performed the flanker task, all of them, okay? Um, the first thing we did with our cohort of these uh, bilinguals was to study simply the effect of age on brain structure. Okay. So I'm not yet correlating the flanker and other things, but it's just interesting uh, uh, where do I find an aging effect in the brain, okay? And so we did this uh, hierarchical multiple regression with age as the last uh, re regressor. TIV means total intracranial volume, okay? This is, this is how you can control uh, 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 individual factors, okay? Because not all brains are the same size, okay? So you can correct it with, uh, if you calculate the total intercranial volume. We found, interestingly, this area in the left temporal pole, okay, where our subjects show an effect of aging. Okay? 
um, this area, the left temporal pole or temporal poles in general, have been for a long time a mystery in cognitive neuroscience. Okay? No one really knew what uh, these areas uh, 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 were for. Okay? The only uh, notion we have comes from some psychosurgical experiments in the 30s and 40s. There was once a field in medicine called psychosurgery. Okay? You have some behavioral uh, uh, alteration, okay? like uh, schizophrenia, whatever, then they cut pieces of your brain. Okay? It didn't work out. Okay, thanks God, no one is doing it anymore, except if you have those uh, untreatable epilepsy, then still a surgeon could, could do it, okay? And many of those uh, patients who got this kind of surgery, cutting this area, would become probably more psychopaths, okay? Uh, it's, it's linked to our behavior. But in recent years, uh, thanks to neuroimaging especially, uh, we have much more insights about uh, this area, okay? Uh, we now know that we have in our brain two different pathways for language processing. It's uh, very similar to what happens for visual processing, where you have a what and where pathway. Now we have the same for, for language. We have a dorsal pathway and we have a ventral pathway. Okay? The dorsal uh, pathway would be the where pathway. Okay? It's more important for grammar and phonology in language. And then you have this ventral pathway, which is the what pathway. So it's more about semantics and lexical semantics. So we know now that this specific area here Okay, is involved in lexical semantics. Okay? And we know also that a part of the frontal lobes, it is the first, one of the first areas that goes into physiological atrophy. Okay? It means that during healthy aging, this area just shrinks. Okay? You can see it here. This is someone with no disease at all. Okay? But this is the temporal pole. It's, like, it's really uh, like a point. Okay? It's not anymore round like it should be. And if you now put these two notions together, yes, that it's involved in lexical semantics and it's the first area uh, to go into atrophy, just keep in mind, what's the first symptom, cognitive symptom of our grandparents, of our parents or grandparents? Well, remember is to walk. What? Olfaction? Say again? Yeah, like the news of this No. Perfect. It's word finding problems, okay? So, uh, and it's probably because this area does not work anymore perfectly, okay? So they struggle usually finding uh, words, okay? Not only in the lab on picture naming, but also in, in real life, okay? So, in the second step, we just took whatever we had except the flanker, uh, like our uh, social demographic. Uh, uh, variables and we try to correlate it to this area to see if one of those factors may be protective, okay, because we found there are an aging effect. We are interested to see does one of those variables protect this area against aging. Global cognitive functioning does not. Years of education does not. The SCS, social economic status, does not. Exposure to a second language had no effect. But naming had. Which makes sense, because you just told me this area is important for word finding, okay? But interestingly, it was not L1 naming, okay? The effect was driven only by second language naming. The better our subjects were in second language naming, the less aging effect, i.e. atrophy, they had in this area, okay? It means only those subjects who are highly proficient, and they well the second language, have neuroprotection. And this we will see better in, in the subsequent experiments is actually the message you should always keep, keep in mind. Like, it is not sufficient enough to be bilingual. You must have good mastery. You must use probably uh, uh, your second language to have neuroprotection. Yes? What? What do you mean which study? Yes. I will show you what it is, because there's something more interesting. Because when we saw this, we said, wow, wonderful. It would make a big impact. So we wrote the paper, we sent it, but it came back. The reviewers said, my story you're telling us. But in order to do the, this, you need a monolingual control group. You need some regions of interest also. 
uh, of control, okay, to compare, compare your data, so you have to do everything again. And we did it, okay, and this is the study I'm, I'm mentioning, it, but the problem was, where do you find monolinguals in Hong Kong? You don't, you don't find them. There are monolinguals, but they're usually of a very low educational level and socioeconomical uh, status. Hence, we cannot, we cannot use them. Good thing is, Hong Kong has the same scanner model as we have in Milan. So I just did something, someone says it's unorthodox, but uh, uh, I think it's not. I took a control group from Milan, a monolingual control group, okay? The scanner is the same, so we can, we can, we can use it. Uh, uh, lifestyle is not so much different between Hong Kong and Milan, even if it's on two different uh, continents. Uh, the diet is different, okay? But there's still this discussion what diet is more superior, the Mediterranean diet or the Chinese diet against the... Uh, I haven't data on that, but I'm just saying there are small, small differences, but you can still do such a study, okay? So we took the monolinguals from Milan and age match and match also for all other variables and compared them to the bilinguals from Hong Kong. And you see here, monolinguals as compared to bilinguals have more areas in which you find aging effects. Okay? And the direct comparison between the two groups resulted in this huge difference still in the left temporal pole. Okay? In the sense that bilinguals have less aging effects in this area. Okay? And we also took some re uh, regions of, of control and for all regions we found uh, that bilinguals have uh, more, uh, have increased gray matter than monolinguals. And also the correlation which we did with, with naming, okay, with second language naming, was still found in the same area, okay? So this study was published, you have seen it, but, I mean, the result is nice, but I was a little bit puzzled. How comes? Just, we started at 9.30, I was talking about uh, one specific aspect of bilingualism or not, and I sh show you now some data about neuroprotection, but it's not what I have expected, isn't it? No? For you grown-ups, questions, no? I would expect in my first experiment with aging populations to find clear effects in con language control areas. This is not a language control area. This is an area linked to lexical semantics. Okay? I didn't expect this, I tell you honestly. I really was sure I would find something uh, in, in other areas. We find something also in other areas in, in other experiments which I will, I will show you, but this was really unexpected, okay? But then, uh, of course, you have to adapt. You have to think, why do we find differences specifically in that area? Do you have any suggestions? Well, is it <clears throat> possible there's greater lexical representation and therefore more ways of accessing words and meaning? I think it's exactly this. That, uh, it, yes, it, it's this really the story that uh, we suppose there's one semantic system, even if there are maybe differences, but that, that semantic system is linked to two different lexicons and, uh, and by handling them in some way, accessing them may provide you this, uh, this difference. Okay? So this goes really uh, far away from language control, but it's just the fact that you have to, uh, you have to lexical systems increases uh, gray matter in that specific area and provides you with a neural protection. Okay? Uh, I went around with this, with this data for three years all over the world. I do my presentations and I get always the same comment. What comment do I always get? The same criticism. It's even not so complicated. I get a much more, uh, I'll say, simple comment about this. I always get the criticism about this. So. You're only measuring lexis and not grammar? You, even, it, it's complicated. No. Everyone just told me, yeah, you know, data are nice, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not nice comparing Hong Kong to Milan. Mm -hmm. 
You, you, yes, I mean, I mean, okay. So I heard the story about uh, two years, whatever. Then we decided to to run the same experiment with other subjects uh, from South Tyrol, and uh, and as you see here, uh, it's here. Okay, South Tyrol. We find the same effects also for South Tyrol, for <coughs> European aging bilinguals. Okay, uh, we have sim It's not 100 percent the same, but we have similar effects in the same brain area. Like bilinguals have less aging effects in the temporal pose as compared to monolinguals. Okay? So I can really uh, calm down all criticism, criticism that we did uh, experiments in so, uh, with so different uh, subjects from different ethnicities and uh, uh, languages, whatever. And there are also some other experiments coming out from different labs who report similar findings. Even uh, Alan Bialisos group in Canada did in 2015 an experiment in which they measured white matter and gray matter densities uh, in a group of aging uh, bilinguals. And they also find a strong effect in the left temporal pole, okay, which correlates with aging okay, only for monolinguals. There's no correlation with age, I mean, as in chronological age, for bilinguals. On the other hand, the data is really interesting. It increases with age. Okay? So one hypothesis may be that maybe the years of exposure of a bilingual okay, still stimulates that area to, to you cannot say, you cannot use the word grow, but to still make synapses. Okay? This I haven't mentioned, but I have to tell you, we don't know yet up to date, what increase in gray matter exactly means at the cellular level. Because you all should know that uh, uh, after, uh, after a certain age, like four or five, six years, it's impossible to increase the number of neurons. Okay? It will always remain the same. It will actually decrease. So gray matter increase cannot mean increase of neurons. It probably means increase of synapses between neurons or increase of supporting cells. Okay? Not all cells in the gray matter are neurons. A lot of cells are supporting cells who have to bring the energy uh, to, to neurons and who have to help in the metabolism of, of neurons. Okay? But we don't know yet exactly what the meaning is. And uh, the authors of this paper actually made this beautiful graph of uh, gray matter trajectory uh, in aging populations. There's also a study by, by Stein et al. in uh, younger subjects. And they see how, how bilingualism really uh, protects that area from, uh, from physiological loss of cells. Finally, okay, at the same time we were doing another experiment, this time not in Hong Kong, but in Beijing, with aging bimodal bilinguals. Okay? It's a different type of bilingualism. But if you find the same effects also in this type of bilingual one, you can really make a universal statement. It's really handling two different language systems that gives you this, this effect. Okay? In, this, in this case, we, we compared uh, aging by modal bilingu bilinguals to uh, uh, monolinguals who spoke uh, an oral language. And we find two areas of interest in which there is an interaction between the age and, and group. One was, again, temporal lobe, anterior temporal lobe, close to the temporal pole, and where we don't find aging effects okay, for bilinguals. It actually also, in this case, in, it's this one, it, it increases. And the other one was the left, uh, don't worry, uh, the left frontal uh, insula. So I can really uh, calmly say uh, that as a very powerful effect of bilingualism on Temporal pole areas. Uh, just a bit. Uh, do you think that we can make the same applications of the effect on uh, language control or bilingual control when you compare bilingual uh, bilingual bilingual people? Yeah. For example, working with bilingual people, say that bilingual maybe maybe you were the, maybe you have been the review of this paper because that's what, what one reviewer asked. <laughs> Actually, he, he wanted to reject the paper, but then, I, yeah. But I, I, I told them, look, wait. I have my subjects from Hong Kong, 
Okay? Because in the final version of the paper, we make a comparison between monolinguals, bimodal bilinguals, and unimodal bilinguals. Okay? And both groups behave similarly on, the, on this area. Okay? The difference between unimodal bilinguals and bimodal bilinguals is that some authors say that bimodal bilinguals uh, doesn't use language control so much. Okay, while, while another line of research says they still use it. Okay, there's a, there's there's this uh, discussion, but uh, I know that even people like uh, Karen Emery or whatever they they, don't, they actually don't don't postulate that bimodal bilingualism uh, entails a lot of language control. In this in this case, it was not our hypothesis. Okay, but in this case, I was interested to to see if bimodal uh, bilingualism. Uh, really has the same influence on that specific area. Okay? Because even science uh, has the semantic system and, and, and the lexicon. So it should also enrich everything and have an effect on this, uh, on this area. Did you run a similar group with your Pardon? Did you run a similar group with your languages? No. In this, in this case, we have... Uh, well, European languages, the, the, the bilinguals from Hong Kong, uh, Cantonese English. Uh, uh, you mean languages or subjects? That's the difference. This study is entirely uh, an Asian study. So we have only subjects from, from, from Asia. But, with, um, but I don't expect any differences because. By, by using bilingual models, you're talking about. We, in this study, the, and, and sign language. Sign. Yeah, this is Chinese sign language. They're all from Beijing. There are, of course, differences between uh, um, uh, Caucasian and Asians, for instance, uh, uh, which depends, of course, on language use. I started actually telling you, whatever Chinese speaker surely uh, uh, uses more right hemisphere than not uh, um, speak of a European uh, al alphabet. But we don't, there are, there are some groups, but I don't know, I'm not so much into this field, there are some groups who actually really study uh, this ethnical differences in brain structure, okay? I know the field about brain function, okay, there are the differences, but uh, I have no idea about brain structure. Say again, your question, I didn't get it. If naming? Naming is a very specific production task. Do you think there's something about um, the task specific? Of, of course there is. Uh, each, each task has its own uh, uh, um, brain mechanism. Uh, but task, look, uh, uh, word generation, if it's a single language, it's always uh, generation, they behave very, very similar. But each is is may have little differences. I'll just make you a very simple example so uh, no one forgets it. Uh, functional neuroimaging is, always, is also used before brain surgery, close to language areas. And you, and you usually don't use only a naming task to see where are the language areas, so I cannot touch that. Okay? I don't, of course, I, maybe if I have a brain tumor, I want to save language areas so I get out everything else. You don't use only naming. You use naming, repetition, word generation, okay. and, and some other things, yes. And then, then you make your idea where the language areas are. Okay. Um, I come back now to this. Okay. You've seen this uh, uh, brain image uh, before. As I mentioned to you, these are converters who, for mild cognitive impairment, will one day convert to uh, full-blown Alzheimer's dementia. And the effect is found in this area. And you have seen also the study by McKelly and colleagues, who in 2004 compared with uh, voxel based morphometry um, bilinguals to monolinguals, and they found increased gray matter for bilinguals. Was it the same with a different population in Hong Kong? Okay. Uh, we had two groups of bilinguals, as I mentioned before Cantonese English and Mandarin Cantonese. Okay. And the first thing we did is to compare them globally, 
specifically for those areas, both parietal lobes, to our monolingual controls. Okay? And as you see, bilinguals have also, in this case, like Michaelis paper, increased gray matter than monolinguals. Okay? In the left inferior parietal lobe and in the right side. Okay? So we can calmly confirm the data of Michaeli. However, it's written here very small, okay? we don't find any effects of age of second language acquisition. Remember that Michele found a strong effect of age of second language acquisition in the sense that the sooner, the earlier in life you learn a second language, the more gray matter you have in that specific area. We don't find any of those effects and we had a great variability of age of L2 acquisition in our subjects. How comes? What do you think? That's a question to you. I know the solution. I won't tell you. It's not proficiency. It's probably that the years of exposure and use of a language may overcome really age of language acquisition effects. Keep in mind, normally when we do our experiments like McKelly did, we usually use students. Okay? So an average age around 20, 22, 23, 24, okay? And uh, if you set the limit, if you're very conservative and you set the limit between early and late age of acquisition at six, okay, uh, or if you're less conservative, you, you put it at 12, then the, the time passed between your actual age of 22 and the age of, of 12 is just 10 years. Okay? If you have someone who is 70 and he has learned, she has learned second language at the age of 20, he or she is still I've used it for at least 50 years, okay? And this fact, at least for brain structure, I'm not talking about brain function, but brain structure makes a huge difference, okay? So we have to keep this in mind whenever we study different populations, aging populations, young subjects, uh, uh, adults, and, and aging populations. What we see, of course, is in both areas we find aging effects for monolinguals, but not for bilinguals. This is one message, okay? So uh, there's neuroprotection also in this area, okay? At least one area that has to do also with language control, we find neuroprotection. And there's also a huge effect of proficiency, okay? And it was so, so funny because we find the effect of proficiency on the left side and an effect of exposure on the right side, okay? And then we did another step. We compared the two subgroups of bilinguals we had, Cantonese English, versus Mandarin Cantonese bilinguals, okay? And what do you think, who had more gray matter in that area? What type of bilingualism? Cantonese English or Mandarin Cantonese? Cantonese English. Cantonese English. It's a good answer, but it's the wrong answer. <laughs> it's Mandarin Cantonese, okay? How come? What? Are you from Barcelona? Yeah. It's the same here. I mean, why do you find so many effects on, on, on uh, Spanish Catalan uh, bilinguals? They are close languages. Uh, because there's more competition, because languages are similar. Okay? So language distance has an effect. Okay? It's not what we think the more distant the languages are, the more difficult it is. It is not. Okay? It's probably some, some researchers say it's even much more easier to keep apart two distant language systems and not two linguistically similar languages, okay? So the conflict is higher when you have to deal with two linguistically similar languages. Hence, you have to use much more control areas and you probably have more neuroplasticity in that areas. Another study in which we use the same subjects, uh, uh, I don't have the data here, but uh, in this study we actually correlated the flanker, okay? And, uh, 
I don't have the pictures here, but it correlated with uh, the right prefrontal cortex in which uh, there was uh, an aging factor for both groups, but performance only correlated for, uh, better performance correlated only for bilinguals. But in this, in this cohort, we also did a, a huge comparison between 30 bilinguals and 30 monolinguals, and we find a huge difference, like in the study with younger subjects in the ACC. This is all, whatever is blue is where bilinguals have more gray matter as compared to monolinguals. Then I have to explain you these two concepts. We talked already about it, but uh, it's better to be very, very uh, uh, precise about this, okay? Uh, neuroprotection is given by these two different mechanisms. One is neural reserve, and the other one is neural compensation. What have I shown you now in these last three experiments in which we, we found increased gramma density would go under the term neural reserve. I've built up more gray matter, which one day will help me to cope better, maybe with cognitive decline, okay? Neural compensation is a different concept. It's the one you've seen in the, in the PET experiments. It means that whenever I'm faced with a lot of loss of brain structure, but I still function normally, in, in some way I compensate, okay? And I use better my brain areas, okay? This was very, very, simple study done still in Canada in which the authors uh, uh, took retrospectively all CT scans of patients with Alzheimer's disease, okay? And they, and they compared the amount of atrophy between bilinguals and monolinguals, okay? Keeping, for instance, uh, cognitive testing, okay, their neuropsychological status constant. And the outcome was that bilinguals have already much more brain atrophy in the brain, which led the authors to postulate that they compensate better, okay? And this goes under the term neural compensation. Despite having so much loss in your brain, you still function uh, uh, or normal or comparable to your control group with less atrophy, okay? This is a study I mentioned to you. Uh, um, in which we had almost 50 uh, patients with uh, Alzheimer's dementia from South Tyrol, okay? And we compared them to 50, almost 50 or 48 patients with Alzheimer's dementia from, uh, from Milan, a monolingual group, okay? Uh, and I have to tell you uh, that on some tests, the bilinguals were much better than the monolinguals, okay? Especially on memory, and on visual spatial tasks, okay? Unfortunately, we had no testing of, of executive functions, okay? Because even this is a retrospective study, we just got all PET scans and the language history and the proficiency, but we had no uh, data on uh, executive functioning. What you see here is the comparison between bilinguals and normal and healthy controls and monolinguals versus healthy controls, okay? Which you see better on, on this brain, okay? Which is hypometabolism i.e. where we have more brain atrophy. And for bilingual, it's much more. Okay? And the most interesting thing is, in average, our bilingual subjects were five years older than the monolingual patients. So apart from this fancy brain images, uh, uh, even this study confirms this almost universal finding like four to five years of, uh, of uh, dementia delay. We then went on and correlated uh, this index, which we called bilingualism index, which is uh, uh, a mixture between proficiency and exposure to brain uh, hypermetabolism, okay? And in here, there's also a very important message. Those subjects who were more, whose, whose bilingual index was higher either more bilingual there, they have an increased proficiency and exposure, had more brain atrophy. Okay. I don't have these pictures here, but we have done also in the paper another kind of analysis in which we measured brain connectivity. Well, because PET data, PET is a functional me measurement. Uh, we measured the connectivity for the executive network and for the default network. And it's in interesting to see that despite their brain atrophy, the connectivity 
in the executive network and in the default network was higher for bilinguals than monolinguals. It's a sort of index that they are in some way compensating better using uh, their frontal net networks. With Daniela Perani, we wrote this opinion article in this, uh, in this journal in which we ex explained the two mechanisms by which uh, uh, how bilingualism gives you neuroprotection. And as I mentioned uh, before, <laughs> lifelong usage of two or more languages as an enhancement of executive control. And here, please, uh, I must correct myself. There's also the effects we've seen before on lexical semantics. Okay? But we were talking mostly here about executive control. On the one hand, I have neurostructural changes, increases in gray and white matter, which we label as, new, uh, as neural reserve. On the other hand, bilingualism gives me those neurofunctional changes, and I end up with probably better brain connectivity that may compensate one day better uh, in, in life to cope against cognitive uh, decline. <coughs> I'm almost finished with this, uh, some conclusions and especially what we need for our future directions is longitudinal studies that really follow up uh, dementia uh, uh, patients, but I guess uh, Barcelona is already working on this. Uh, more PET studies because they give you an idea about brain metabolism and it would be nice to have studies who compare bilingualism versus other <coughs> cognitive activities, okay, it would be nice to have uh, a huge aging study in which you have on one hand uh, languages, diet, physical activities, <coughs> musical activities, other cognitive activities just to see uh, how, they, how they play together or what of these factors has the strongest effect. Okay? And there's a, there's a last future direction which I have just mentioned here. It will be also wonderful to study the effects of, of dialects. Okay? Uh, I know only of one or two papers that were actually sent to our journal in which the authors uh, uh, compared with an executive task uh, um, Dutch Frisian dialect speakers to, uh, against a group of monolinguals and they have found actually uh, a small, small effect. But uh, Friesisch, yes. Frisian is not a dialect. Well, they, they call it as a, as a, as a dialect. Well, it's not, it's not true. Huh? I mean, it's a language, okay? But, Yeah, no, I know. Well, it's it's difficult. I mean, we, we can we can argue what's the difference between language and, exactly. and dialect. Mm -hmm. uh, in if in Germany you wouldn't call it a, a language, we would call it a dialect. Frisian. West Friesian, North Friesian, yes. Or you go to Italy, you listen to Sicilian. It's a language, but they call it a dialect. Yeah. Yes. So. Uh, <coughs> You know, Weinreich in 53 said the difference between language and dialect is that the language has an army and a flag, while the dialect has not. Yeah. Well, but these things even change, yes. Oh, well. but, I, but trust me, there are also studies on, uh, with, with patients on, on dialects. Uh, we had in Italy uh, this study published, uh, some colleagues of us, with uh, uh, a patient speaker of a dialect which is speaking in, a, in, a, in Venice, and that's really a dialect, it's not a language, okay? And the patient lost exclusively the use of that language and not Italian, okay? So, but as, I'm, as I say, this is important to study dialects and, uh, and even language distance, for instance. I always finish my presentations with this slice, okay? It's, it's very beautiful. <laughs> These are nice sausages, okay, of, of the brain. Uh, we have four different subjects. Uh, one is a monolingual, one is a bilingual from South Tyrol, one is a bilingual from Hong Kong, and one is a ex-colleague of ours, a linguist who speaks 29 languages. They're all around 72 years old, all, all four subjects, okay? Seven, yes. Uh, unfortunately, he died last year. I don't, uh, he was really a uh, uh, very, very nice linguist who, when he was young, was the official translator uh, for Ho Chi Minh between Russian and uh, Vietnamese, yes. 
Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a guy who established the Institute of Oriental Languages in Prague. Okay? Uh, in the last six languages, he learned actually in the last 10 years of his life. And we could test him, trust me, we could test him only in nine languages because I don't have so many people available that can help us. Okay? And he mastered them perfectly. Okay? So I really trust him when he tells us he speaks 29 languages. Okay? These are simple MR scans. There's no analysis on this. There's no uh, voice based morphometry, no, no function, no structure, just a simple slice. You tell me, who is this guy? This super polyglot. Well, I must turn around because it's this one. Look, look how beautiful the brain is. Uh, we talked before with the temporal lobe, okay? It's all round here. Okay? Oops. It really seems that language makes a difference. So, and who is the bilingual from Hong Kong? Which one? This year? This year or this year? This year? How do you see it? What? No, there is a way of seeing it, okay, because there are differences in Asian and Caucasian brains, and you see it, yes, yes. Like the form, it's a little bit more flat in the front, like this one, so you can recognize it with this, but I can recognize it differently, okay, and I, and I, will, I will tell you. This is the uh, bilingual from uh, South Tyrol, okay. Uh, there is a difference between uh, South Tyrolians and uh, Hong Kongers, if we take the same age, okay. We had to discard many subjects from our cohort in South Tyrol. South Tyrol is in the mountains, okay. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, they don't have the healthiest diet, okay. You still eat a lot of meat, a lot of butter, and all the things, uh, so they all have, not all, many of them have really small vessel diseases in their brain, okay, which you don't see in Hong Kong, okay, because the diet is, is really healthy, okay, and which you don't see in comparable uh, age-matched monoliments from Milan, because you eat more the Mediterranean diet in Milan, okay. So this is the reason why you can, you can see it. Uh, do you have some questions on this? Is it already so late, 1.20? Ah, so I cannot talk about the bilingual fiction. Okay, it's okay. So I'm finished. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to all people here. But we have some time for questions now, if you want to. Not yet. We, yeah. we have done one study, but not with brain imaging. It's a behavioral study done with uh, around uh, 100 uh, children from uh, South Tyrol. Uh, we, we actually studied for, for also compared it with musical activities and, uh, and physical activities. Uh, the second most powerful after uh, language was musical activities. Yes. Music. Yeah. No, language was more powerful. Yes. Yes. yes, but it's a study with children, okay? And as I mentioned before here, we just need much more studies uh, that make this comparison. Is there any study with dancers, for example? Oh, there are a lot of studies with dancers, but not comparing bilinguals to, to dancers. No, they, they are, yes. Yes. Dancers meaning. You compare, yes, you, you compare dancers to non-dancers, uh, you compare even singers to non-singers, musicians to, uh, or, or people who are active uh, uh, physically to controls. The whole literature is really full of these things. But it would be nice, especially for the aging population, to put them all into the same pot for one time and make comparisons. Question. Uh, I, I have no answer to that. I'm sorry, but maybe Frank. Uh, there is. There is. They looked at uh, 
children who are on the autism spectrum disorders continuum and their acquisition and, the, and also they looked at the possibility that um, bilingualism may mitigate some of the negative effects of autism because of these executive control kinds of benefits. They, I think I, uh, I can talk about the acquisition stuff later, but on the business of whether it mitigates the effects, I think there's no clear evidence that that's not the case. Some people find it, I think, that it's not very consistent. I mean, one of the dilemmas is the kid with autism spectrum sort of very enormous in many, many ways. It's hard to get a nice study. Questions or are you fine? There are many studies, but uh, it doesn't make any difference. The only difference, the only difference it makes, if you're talking about functional activity, is really proficiency. You can be simultaneous bilingual, but you still may be uh, uh, outperformed by a late bilingual, like a subsequent bilingual, who is more proficient on the second language and who is more ex ex exposed. So we, in this field, we totally have abandoned those terms like subsequent, uh, simultaneous bilingual. Uh, to me personally. They make little, little sense. We just have to always to study. Of course, age of, of, of uh, acquisition, we study exposure and proficiency. But uh, really, those terms uh, we slowly have abandoned. In India, in India, are you We, we have a lot of data from, from India. I didn't have the time to show them. Beautiful data, you know, young subjects and, and old subjects. Yeah. I mean, India is perfect. As I showed you in my first slide, uh, we find the Bengali, English bilinguals, Hindi, in the, uh, English bilinguals, we find trilinguals and, and really. So it, it's, it's another really country perfect for studying uh, different types of bilinguals, but specifically also for linguistic distance. Okay. In one of, of the studies we have, we actually compare bilinguals from Europe, like two Indo-European languages, with bilinguals from India. You still have two Indo-European languages, but the distance is, is bigger. Two bilinguals in Hong Kong, who speak one uh, uh, European language and one Asian language. So you can really study uh, this, uh, the effect of linguistic distance. Thank you so much. No, another question? You're killing me. <laughs> okay, last one. Um, how many of these studies can be done for just some sort of sampling panels where the bilinguals have basically a different, so they come from the different populations and have different characteristics, and you know, differences than the one or the other to do with that. So, to give you an example, like with the change case, you see an effect of playing change. Oh, what? In the change example, right? So, I haven't understood. Chess. 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 I know, but the people playing chess are not bilinguals, it's a study on... No, 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 but I'm putting this as an example for bilingualism as well. So what does it mean to... That's a di discussion we, we can have. It's a long discussion. Yes. Yes. I know. But no, I guess, see, 
most of studies control for these for these factors. But but the problem is you can say okay, uh, do you especially for younger subjects, not not for the aging population, uh, do you become uh, proficient in two languages because you have already a perfect brain for for learning uh, one or two languages, or is it the other way around? I would think That's, it'd be more of a problem with the older, but well, because younger ch children are often bilingual because of circumstances yeah. they don't choose. Yeah. But people who start learning a language afterwards, the argument might be more potent that maybe the people who not only select to become bilingual but become proficient bilingual have some kind of genetic or innate or some kind of advantage. Because they choose. You, I know. So it's a question of agency. But keep in mind. Keep in mind, these this two slides I've shown you about the individual differences. Yes. Okay. So that really prevents me from giving a clear answer because I have to see much deeper into that. I, I was showing, I don't know if you were there, the, the slices we are, uh, of the uh, parasingulate sulcus. Okay. That there are also individual differences. So, and I guess in the future we have to take into account also those factors. There are, in response to that, I think there are studies, correct me, you probably know this, that, that actually uh, look at changes uh, over time in a relatively short period of time. So people were learning a second language, uh, and they look at time one and time two, and they also yeah. look at executive functions or other things. And I think some of this has been done with the ERB. It is, it is done with children, but, but uh, Okay, I should maybe, uh, as a last message, tell you also about these people in Hong Kong. I imagine, because then you can even answer uh, children or eggs, whatever. Uh, look, the subjects in Hong Kong, okay, they, they learn uh, the second language around uh, the age of uh, three, four, seven, eight, they don't native Japanese people. They use the English for school, university, work, okay, so they're kind of proficient, and then please show me the different kinds of okay. Uh, those of them who retire, okay, most of them don't use that more English. Okay? And all advantages go away. Okay? Only those, this is why we do this correlation to this exposure and proficiency. Only those who still maintain a high exposure usage and proficiency of English okay, have this neuroprotective effect. This is actually the message you should actually bring home because it's not sufficient to be bilingual to have neural protection. It's only valid for some types of bilingualism, okay? Especially those who really use the two languages still in that age. Okay? But this is why I think it's the fact of uh, bilingualism. If it's, uh, <laughs> if it's the egg or if it's the chicken. We also have bilingual eggs if you want. <laughs>